it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I have the ability to sense the demonic. One hell of a birthday. I've been having a difficult time typing all of this out. Not only am I not a writer, but I've been debating whether or not sharing this so openly is such a good idea. I've had the ability to sense the demonic ever since I was a child, and that's the only reason that I could come up with as to why what had happened to me a week ago hadn't dragged me by the balls, descending me into complete, utter madness. No matter how many times I tried to keep it controlled, it didn't get any easier. I was twelve when I discovered what I could do. With no one to help me, I had to learn how to keep it hidden. I know that it must sound absolutely batshit insane, but it's the truth, whether anyone believes me or not. It was an hour after I'd showered and dressed when I caught a glimpse of headlights from Roland's Jeep as he pulled into the driveway. Roland and I had been roommates for over a year now, after my grandmother passed, but well, we've been best friends since I was ten, a few months after my parents' tragic deaths. At around 6'2 and handsome with dark brown hair, olive skin, hazel eyes and an outgoing personality, he was usually the centre of attention. At one time I would even grown feelings for him. Well, Roland wasn't a homophobic asshole, but to avoid any awkwardness between us, I just decided to keep my feelings to myself. Not to mention that Roland seemed to have shown zero discernible interest beyond our friendship. Roland smiled and waved as I made my way over. Hey, Gavin. Sorry I'm late. Roland said as he reached over to move his duffel bag to the back seat. Traffic was a freaking nightmare. I shook my head and shrugged. <laughs> Don't worry about it, man. Oh, uh, hey, uh, you sure you're still up for tonight? I mean, if you want. Roland shook his head. Hold up. Are you seriously suggesting that we postpone your 21st? Nope. Unacceptable. Well, what's the big deal anyway? I asked. You know, I've had my first drink when I was 16. Well, not only that, but the pandemic really had narrowed the places we could go to. The bowling alley was open, so we decided that was the place to hang out. Yeah, now you'll be able to drink legally like every other adult. Plus, I've been stuck inside a cabin in the woods for an entire week, so damn right we're going to celebrate. For years, Roland had been going on vacation with his family once a month perks of working with his father. His whole family were close-knit, and they usually did a lot of things together, and sometimes I envied him for it. Oh, and, uh, did you forget? Arian will be there, too, Roland added. He wiggled his eyebrows, and I smiled warmly at the thought of seeing her in person for the first time. Her and I have been chatting online for months, and we fell for each other immediately. Rather than being the manic pixie dream girl... Arian embodied that cliché with a toughness. She had a unique personality and had a few things in common with me. She had shoulder-length black hair, dipped in pink tips, embellished by pale skin and beautiful icy blue eyes. She told me how her friends would compare her looks to Alexandra Didario, and quite honestly, I could see it. We arrived at the bowling alley at around seven to meet up with the others. Arian waved at us as we got out of the jeep and put on our masks. The petite, curly blonde who stood next to her was her best friend, Shelby, and the tall, beefy, dark-skinned man was Shelby's fiancé, Jasper. I kind of knew them from high school, but we'd barely talked. We were more like ships passing in the night. As far as places went in a small town, the bowling alley was well cared for, but the balls for rent came with small notches taken out and lanes featured a few divots here and there. Well, in my opinion, it wasn't ideal if you were seeking competitive sport, but... The fry oil that wafted from the snack bar was enticing enough to compensate. I walked up to the register where Arian stood with her purse open, apologising to the plump boarding man behind the counter. Oh, crap. I must have left my wallet at home or something. Here, let me, I offered as I pulled out my own wallet and placed enough cash down for both of us. Arian looked up at me as the man handed us two pairs of shoes. You didn't have to do that, Gavin, she said. And she grabbed her shoes and tucked her purse underneath her arm. Especially not on your birthday. It's fine. Don't worry about it. 
I shook my head and grabbed my scuffed up bowling shoes and thanked the man for being patient with us. The guy just gave me a beleaguered sigh in return. I didn't blame him. If I had to deal with all the children's parties that happen here quite often, I'd probably be a little bitter too. After I'd laced up my shoes, I made my way over to the racks that displayed the different variety of balls. I ran my hand over a few available options before I eventually settled on a black one with a purple printed skull on it. Arian walked up beside me and my chest swelled. Hey, I said. Hey. She glanced down at the ball I had in my hands. Oh, nice choice. That's usually my go-to when I come here with my dad. Oh, do you want this one? I can pick a different one, I said. It's fine. I just think it's kind of cool that we have similar tastes in balls. She chuckled as she grabbed a crimson ball with golden swirls on it. She held it up and I watched as her slender fingers slid into the holes. I was about to crack a joke about it when I suddenly felt lightheaded. I glanced around, but nothing really stood out to me until I looked over at the snack bar. A tall, wiry man with shaggy blonde hair stood at the register with his back toward me. His head snapped in my direction, and my breath hitched. I watched as his true face rippled beneath his human facade. His skin was milky white, and his obsidian eyes narrowed at me. I quickly averted my eyes and placed the ball on the rack. "'Hey, Gavin, are you all right?' Arian asked giving me a look of concern. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just going to go to the restroom. I'll be right back. As I washed my hands in the sink, I kept replaying that man's face in my head. My heart raced and I felt hot. I needed to calm down. Maybe you didn't see me. Maybe it's all in my head. Maybe. When I looked up at my reflection, something made me stop and take a second look in the mirror. What the hell? thought to myself as I kept examining my face. My throat squeezed with fear as I stared at the left side of my face. Black, spidery, thread-like lines creeped from my scalp and across my cheek. They interlaced with one another. Instead of my natural grey, my eyes were oily black. What the fuck? Oh, that was a new one. I nearly panicked as I quickly backed away from the mirror, and I yelped when I heard a knock on the other side of the door. Hey, Gavin, are you in there? It was Roland. Uh, I glanced back at the mirror and expected to see dark lines and black eyes. But there was nothing, it was just my normal face that stared back at me. I debated whether or not to open the door. There was possibly a demon ordering pizza, and there was a good chance he saw me and my face. Another knock. Gavin, are you in there? You didn't get stuck in the toilet, did you? I took a few moments before I calmed myself down, placed my mask back on and unlocked the door. Roland was right outside giving me a worried look. Whoa, man, are you alright? You're looking a bit pale. I took a deep breath and nodded. Yeah, I'm fine. Come on, let's start the game already, I said, walking back over to the rack. I just need to keep my head down, and if I see that man again, I'll just have to ignore him. We all sat in the uncomfortable plastic chairs as Jasper stepped up first. We all watched as his ball rolled all the way to the left and right into the gutter. I thought you were an excellent bowler, babe, Shelby giggled. Oh, excuse me, just a bit rusty is all. He faked hurt and kissed her on the forehead. <sighs> You two are so cute, Arian gushed, and then she turned to me. Okay, Gavin, you're up. I got up from the chair and strode up to the wooden platform. I held the ball up and peered over at the newly erect pins. I took a deep breath and drew my arm back and swung it forward with a slight twist. The ball spun dizzily as it flew down the lane with a characteristic curve. Come on, come on, I whispered in a mantra. Luckily, the ball connected with a thunderous crack as all the pins clattered to the floor. Hey, nice job, Roland and Arian cheered. After our game, the five of us headed to the parking lot. So, uh, what are you two doing now? Jasper asked. I zipped up my jacket. I don't know. Probably headed back to our place, I guess. 
Arian, who was walking close beside Shelby, twirled on her heels to face me. You two should come back with us. I glanced over at Roland, who nodded. Well, I'm up for it if Gavin is, since he's the birthday man. I turned back to face Arian. Sure, why not? Awesome. It'll be fun and hey, the night's still young. She winked and followed Shelby to Jasper's car, but not before texting me the address in case we got lost. After about twenty minutes on the road, Roland spoke up. Oh, almost forgot. Will you reach back there and grab the black bag behind my seat? Yeah, sure. I grabbed the bag and set it in my lap. Go ahead and open it. I loosened the red ribbon from the bag and pulled out a rectangular box. Nestled in the black crinkled paper was an obsidian blade. I brushed my fingertips over the silver wolf-shaped handle in awe. The overall length of the blade was six inches at most. It was inside a leather sheath pouch with a belt clip. Holy crap! This is... It sure is. I know you've been wanting to get one for a while now. Plus, I also know how much you love wolves, so I had the handle custom made. Happy birthday, Gav. Thank you so much, I said as I placed the blade back into the box. I was about to place the lid back when suddenly the jeep began to shudder violently and the back of it slid sideways. I jerked back in my seat and the box fell to the floor between my feet. Roland cursed and gripped the wheel as he reduced his speed and eased over to the shoulder of the road. What the hell was that? I asked. I looked out the window, but I couldn't see anything but trees. Oh, God damn it. Roland sighed and unbuckled his seatbelt. I think one of the tires must have blown. You all right, Gav? Yeah, I think so. Good. Just stay here. I'm going to check the damage. Be careful. I called to him as he hopped out of the jeep. There could be monsters out there. Roland turned around and gave me a wink. <laughs> Don't worry, Gav. I can take care of myself. I rolled my eyes. Uh, that's what they say in all the horror movies right before they die. Several minutes later, he opened the driver's side with a frown. Uh, just as I thought, he grumbled as he reached over to turn on the hazards. Tires blown to hell. Oh, damn, I guess somebody doesn't want us to party tonight, I said, sitting back in my seat. Don't you have a spare? Roland nodded. Well, of course I do, but it might take a while. Call Arian and tell her what happened. Oh, wait. I opened the compartment and handed him a flashlight. You should probably take this since it's dark out. Roland looked at it for a moment and then took it, disappearing behind the jeep again. I grabbed my phone from my pocket and dialed her number. I went straight to her voicemail. I tried again, but once again went to her voicemail. I looked down at the screen. No service bars. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I groaned in frustration. Roland came back and opened the door. Good news is I have a spare. Bad news is that I don't have... When he saw my expression, he asked what was wrong. I can't get any signal. That just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I just had service a minute ago. Roland checked his phone as well. Oh, crap. Same. Well, let's not panic. If I remember correctly, we're less than a mile from the closest gas station. We should head there and call for a tow. Maybe you can try calling her back. Seems like a good plan, I said. I unbuckled my seatbelt, but... Before I got out of the jeep, I opened the box and grabbed the blade. I attached the sheath to my belt loop and zipped up my jacket again, hiding it from view. Roland opened the passenger door and grabbed his duffel bag. We were halfway down the road when I smelled something acrid hit my nostrils. I took a tentative step forward and froze as my foot stepped on a large shard of broken glass. I turned to Roland, who stood rigid in place. His eyes wide. I followed his gaze to the left, and what I saw made my blood run cold. It was Jasper's car, or what was left of it. The front of the car was in a ditch. It smelled awful, and it wasn't the engine or cracked radiator. No, I smelled blood. Lots of it. 
The whole left side was damaged and open as if something had ripped through it. The car was empty. I fought through the cold panic that washed over me. I stood with my hands on my thighs and I started to dry heave. Roland looked around as if he was searching for something. Okay, Gaff, we need to leave right now. I stood up and gave him a confused expression. Wait, what? No, we have to find them. They could be hurt or... Gavin. A high-pitched wail tore through the trees. It was feminine. Oh, God. Arian. Without a second thought, I bolted across the road towards the forest. Gavin. I heard Roland screaming for me to stop and come back, but I kept going. I wasn't thinking straight at the time. All I could think about was Arian and every worst-case scenario. My boots sloshed into the muddy ground, and I cursed when I slipped on a pile of leaves as I staggered up a small incline. This caught me off guard since there hadn't been a drop of rain all day. I quickly pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight. I gasped as I spotted specks of blood intermingled with the dirt. I grimaced as a strong metallic scent hit me. I glanced down and noticed that there was a strange tint to the mud which seemed to lead further into the trees in front of me. In between two trees, I saw her. It wasn't Arian, though. It was Shelby. I gulped, and I tentatively made my way over to her. At the sound, she turned her head toward me, her frantic eyes red and blotchy with tears. She managed a weak moan, and the sound that came out made my chest tighten. Her whimpers were a bleak summation of what she'd gone through before I found her. Her jacket was shredded and covered in blood, and her skin was covered in deep lacerations. My thoughts automatically went back to that possessed man. What if he'd followed us and attacked them? What if he's still here somewhere? The rest of my thoughts were interrupted when I heard my name fall from her bloodied lips. Without hesitation, I knelt down and tried my best to console her as I carefully pulled her into my lap. Deep down, though, I knew that it was a pointless effort. I knew that by her bruised and broken body, it was too late to try and call for help regardless if I had service or not on my phone. Her blood soaked into my pants, but I didn't care. I had the urge to find Arian, but I didn't want to leave Shelby here to die alone in the fray. God damn it, I cried. I looked back down at Shelby, who moved her head slightly upward to meet my eyes. Her torn lips opened and she tried to speak, but her voice was barely audible over the sound of my own heartbeat. I stroked her head. Shh, don't speak. Shelby ignored me and tried again. I frowned as I bent my head down just enough so that I could hear her. It's not, she gurgled. It's not. Her whole body shook as she dragged in air. Her lips quivered and then finally her shuddering chest eased. And then she was gone. The cold stillness of the woods pressed down on my heart. Tears fell as I placed her head gently on the forest floor and slowly got to my feet. I had to keep going. I broke through the trees and came upon what looked like an abandoned construction site. From the dirt-covered sign, the large building was meant to be a low-income housing complex with the same layout as a hotel. The area around it was barely lit up by the few streetlights. Part of the chain-link fence that surrounded the building was warped and bent as if something very large had ripped its way through it. I shivered. I spotted Arian's purse by the fence and ran over to pick it up. She must be here somewhere. I made my way down the dirt road toward it. I rounded the corner of the building quickly, frantically searching for a way inside. I almost didn't notice that someone had crossed my path until it was too late and I barely registered the blood-soaked clothes before we collided. Fortunately, I managed to keep my balance, and I grabbed the other by the arm. I gasped in relief when I realized who it was. Holy shit! Er- No! Arian screamed as she struggled to wrench herself away from me. 
Let go of me, you sick... Arian, stop. It's me, Gavin. At the sound of my voice, she calmed down and glanced up at me. Arian threw her arms around me and buried her tear-stained face in my chest. Oh my god, Gavin, she sobbed. How did you find me? Is Shelby and Jasper alive? What? Hold on, Arian. I cut her off. What happened? Are you alright? She nodded. Yeah, the blood. It isn't mine. We crashed and something attacked Jasper. Shelby and I ran into the forest, but then I lost her and came here. There's an entrance there and I hid, she said as she pointed to a large rectangular window. We need to go. Whatever attacked us is probably still around. I nodded and hoped that by the time we got back to the main road, Roland had been able to call for help. I placed my phone in my pocket. I didn't want to risk the light attracting whatever was lurking in the trees. I reached to take her hand in mine, but before I did, I saw something pass over her face, just like the man's hat. Her skin was grey, her eyes inky black, and her mouth split open, revealing razor-sharp teeth. I suddenly screamed and pushed myself away from her, dropping her purse. What's wrong? she asked, startled. She stared at me with human eyes and a human frown. Y your face, I stammered. My face? What's wrong with my face? she asked as she took a step forward. Oh, don't come any closer. I know what I saw, Arian, I screamed. No, not her too. Wait a minute, if I was able to sense the man right then and there, why wasn't I able to do the same with her? Well, the reaction I expected from her would be confusion or anger, but none of that happened. Instead, she just smiled a toothy smile. So it is true, she chuckled. I've been able to blend in amongst your species for a very long time now. No one's ever been able to see through my glamour. That is, until I met you. I'm curious. How are you doing it? An icy cold feeling washed over me and my heart lurched. My stomach twisted with a sensation I couldn't put into words. I couldn't even muster up a response, but Arian didn't seem to be waiting for one. Or can it be that you don't even know her? She cocked her head. It almost makes me wonder what other charming little talents she might be hiding. She started to circle around me. She sized me up as her dark eyes fixed on mine. Well, I've been watching you for a while, and I've got to say I was very surprised you were able to sense one of us so quickly. My heart thudded in my chest. Arian knew this whole time. She knew who that man was, too. Was this some plan to get to me? I tried to keep my ability hidden so that I wouldn't draw any attention from their kind. I must have messed up somewhere. Why? Why wasn't I able to sense the thing inside of you? Arian sighed and stopped moving. Thing? Well, first of all, that was rude. I mean, I may be a demon, but I do have feelings, you know. And to answer your question, I honestly don't know. Although, unlike the one you saw at the bowling alley, I don't need a vessel in order to walk topside. Oh, what a mess this whole thing has become. I knew I shouldn't have used a demon fresh out of hell. They have more of a difficult time controlling themselves. Collateral was... unavoidable. My eyes widened as the jarring realization slammed into me. It was you. I took a few steps back. You're the one behind all of this. Arian crossed her arms over her chest. Wow. Congratulations, you figured it out. I clenched my fists and stood there, horrified by her blatant disregard for her friends. I wondered for a moment if the real Arian was in there somewhere, experiencing the horrors this thing did. Tell me something. Is she still in there? Oh, didn't you listen to anything I just said? The girl you've been talking to has been me all along, genius. The real Arian's gone. Now, you can either come with me willingly, or... I'm not going anywhere with you. Roland's called the cops and they'll be here soon. 
I really hoped she would fall for the bluff. Oh, I highly doubt that. While you were running through the woods like an idiot, you left your friend alone and vulnerable. Poor thing's probably roadkill by now. At that moment, rage poured through me, hot and fast, as it twisted inside me and set me alight with the strength and burn of it. I could feel something primal and dangerous stir within my chest. Before she could react, my fist connected with her cheek. Oh, you bitch, I screamed. I'll fucking kill you. I wanted to rip her eyes out of her skull. I barely registered the pain in my hands as I landed another blow to her face hard enough that she staggered backwards. She snapped her head in my direction and her face contorted into a snarl as she wiped the blood from her mouth. I was going to offer you a choice, dumbass. Her voice deepened and it sounded like something was bubbling from her throat. She glanced down at herself. Oh, this body is too much of a hindrance. I must take you in alive, but... If I happen to rip off a limb or two to keep you from struggling, then so be it. A freight train of horrified amazement slammed into me as her whole body expanded and stretched. She tore roughly at her clothes and threw the material from her body just as her breasts flattened, replaced by a broad and muscular chest. The demon was vaguely humanoid, with a tail that slightly resembled that of a xenomorph's. It stood around eight feet tall on reptilian clawed feet. Black veins pulsed beneath grey skin. Bat-like ears twitched as it dragged in a deep breath through slitted nostrils and its mouth split open, adorned with a row of sharp, jagged teeth. Its black eyes were trained on me. I felt a sudden wave of dread as I stared up at the large, monstrous being in front of me. The demon lunged forward and pulled me in close. I gagged when I caught the coppery odour of recently spilled blood. A large hand grabbed my chin and I flinched as one of its claws sliced into my cheek. I cursed as I threw myself backwards and tugged hard, but it was as useless as a fish struggling on a line. My whole arm ached and I knew that if I kept it up, I'd dislocate it. The demon made a low, guttural growl, but before it could do anything, it paused and lifted its head toward the forest. While it was distracted, I managed to get underneath my jacket and loosen the dagger free from my waistband. I plunged the blade into its neck. Blood spilled from the wound and the demon let out a roar so loud that it made my inside shudder. It released me and recoiled. It thrashed on the ground as it grabbed at the blade. Everything hurt, but I managed to get on my feet, and even though it was tempting, I didn't stick around long enough to admire my handiwork. I also felt a wave of sadness, knowing that I wouldn't be able to get my blade back. Ignoring the pain, I turned and bolted toward the building. I made my way over to the window and quickly hauled myself inside. Without any hope of rescue, I had no other choice but to find some place to hide. I scanned the area noticed that some of the floors were dilapidated and a few were blocked off by debris. The ceiling sagged in some places and it seemed that the creeper vines were all that held them up. I turned a corner and noticed stairs leading up to the second floor. I quickly made my way over. Unfortunately, I wasn't quick enough. I barely made it up the last step when a large, clawed hand grabbed my right leg. How the hell did it get in without me hearing it? Oh, and I didn't kill it. The wound on its neck was in the process of healing. I panicked and slammed my free leg into its face. The demon let go of my leg and tumbled down the stairs. It would have been comical if not for the fact that I was in serious danger. I bolted down the hallway and turned right. I ran into one of the rooms and shut the door behind me. By the light of the moon, I noticed that I stood inside a large room with walls covered in graffiti. Dusty furniture was propped here and there, and wooden pallets lay broken across the room from a decayed, mold-infested mattress. There was a window overlooking the woods. I ran over to it. I tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. I sobbed and collapsed to my knees. My thoughts were hazy at that point, worn thin by exhaustion. I knew that all of this was futile, and I was dealing with someone far more powerful than I was. 
My resignation broke as soon as I heard movement from outside the door. I forced myself to my feet, driven only by an instinct to survive. Oh, the demon tore through the door. I screamed as it lunged from me again and we both fell onto the mattress. It snarled as it pulled me under it with its tail. The demon lowered its head and I managed at the last moment to wrap both of my hands around its throat in order to try and keep its demonic mess of a mouth at bay. I could feel its hot breath brush against my face and the tendons and sinewy muscles in its neck bulged. The demon suddenly paused with its jaws open inches away from my shoulder. It hovered there for a moment, unnaturally still for a predator that had already caught its prey. An oddly unfocused look passed over its face and it growled. What the hell are you? Before I could say anything, a loud angry roar reverberated around us. I blinked as the demon was thrown off of me. My vision refocused and my eyes landed on the two large figures in the middle of the room. The second one was a creature almost the same height as the demon. The beast was bipedal and also vaguely humanoid. Its fur was dark and coarse along its arms and legs, but soft and lighter on its chest and abdomen. His legs jutted out of human hips, but his feet were large paws. His ankles had the forward hog joints of a wolf. His body was wide and muscular, but he still retained an almost slender shape. His face was nightmarish. A werewolf. I looked between these two powerful beings, and that was the moment I truly found out that humans never really held the top of the foon chain. And if that wasn't a giant kick to the evolutionary chain's balls, then I don't know what was. The two of them collided. The werewolf managed to pull the other into a headlock. Its golden eyes pierced into me for one heart-stopping moment before he flipped the demon over his head. I could have sworn that the whole place vibrated from the impact. The demon rebounded onto its feet with a snarl, and both of them sprang away from each other. I groaned as I moved into the shadows, relieved that they were too preoccupied with trying to kill each other to pay any mind to me. The werewolf snapped his jaws and launched himself at the demon. The demon dodged the attack and threw the werewolf down onto the pallets with a sickening crunch. I bumped my arm against something and winced. The demon turned its head back to me and advanced. I panicked and scurried backwards. The werewolf rolled off the broken wood and grabbed the demon by the tail. It managed to dig his fangs into the demon's shoulder. With a shrill cry of pain, the demon twisted and took another swipe of its claws down the werewolf's chest. The werewolf howled and backhanded the demon across the face, and the force sent it reeling into the wall. The werewolf moved toward me in a protective stance, his eyes trained on the demon lying in the hole in the wall. The demon slowly got to its feet, and with a rage-filled beastly roar, it launched itself out of the window. I stood up carefully and turned my gaze to the werewolf still in the room with me. Thanks, I stammered. Uh, we're cool, yeah? His golden eyes seemed to look over me, and then he growled. Nope. Oh, think, Gavin, think, I thought, looking wildly around the dark room for an escape. I glanced over at the window and ran over to it. I hoisted myself up onto the thin rectangular ledge of the window, and even though I wasn't religious, I prayed to whatever deity that I didn't simply topple over to my death. I cried out as a clawed hand latched onto my left leg. In my haste to kick out of his grasp, my hands lost their grip of the roof below me. I felt several claws slice into the skin of my leg as I fell backwards, over the roof and down to the gravel below. I could have sworn the beast whimpered, but the pain was too much, and darkness pulled me under. Part 2 The Cabin in the Woods My eyelids felt as if someone had threaded tiny anchors into each of my eyelashes, impossibly heavy and unwilling to move. 
I imagined that I'd be tearing skin as I peeled them open to blink for the first time in what felt like days. I licked my lips and noticed how dry they were. I dragged in a deep breath and I slowly opened my eyes. With a slight grunt, I hauled myself into a sitting position and winced. Oh, damn it. Okay, that was a mistake because everything ached. There was a switch near the miniature lamp on the dresser and I squinted as the ceiling lights flickered to life. There was an oak desk across from the twin-side linen sheet bed I was tucked in. Next to that stood a large walk-in closet built into the wall and a restroom near the door. I glanced down and noticed that my clothes were replaced with a plain grey tank top and sweatpants. I subconsciously reached for my phone to check the time, but it wasn't on the nightstand. What sat on there, however, was a black picture, a ceramic cup and my wallet. Careful of the slight weakness in my arms, I poured myself a drink. I licked my dry lips and sent a thanks to no one in particular as I drank the water down like it was lifeblood. I suddenly winced again when I moved my leg. Curious, I tentatively removed the thin blanket and rolled up my pant leg, revealing a bandage wrapped tightly around my calf. I took in a few shaky breaths as the recollection of that night doused my veins in ice water. I placed my head in my hands to try and calm the spiral of emotions as tears threatened to spill down my cheeks. I heard a knock and the door opened. I sniffed and rubbed my eyes. Oh, you're awake, said a female voice. Roland will be relieved. He's been freaking out over you since he brought you here all bloody and unconscious. I turned around to the source of the voice. A petite young woman with curly, shoulder-length brown hair, tanned skin, and grey eyes stood in the doorway. She wore black scrubs and a grey mask, carrying a steaming cup in her hands. She closed the door and walked over to me. Roland, wait, he's alive, he's here? A huge wave of relief washed over me, knowing that my best friend was alright. Do you know where he is now? I need to see him. Ignoring the pain, I moved to push the rest of the sheets away from me, and that's when she held out her free hand toward me. Whoa, hold on. I don't know where he is right now, but I'm here to check on you and make sure you drank your medicine when you woke up, she quickly explained as she motioned to the picture. But hey, since you already did, I guess that makes it easier for all of us. Well done, you. I blinked and glanced nervously at the picture beside me. I hadn't even realized that it had been anything but water. You should probably eat, she added. You haven't eaten anything for almost two days. Well, that made sense. Now that I was awake, I could feel a painful gnawing sensation in my stomach. It was a clawing hunger more intense than anything I'd felt before. But then again, I'd never fasted either. Um, you don't happen to have any horses around here, do you? I asked sheepishly. She shook her head and grinned. Nope, sorry. But if you drink this, she offered me the mug, your hunger will go away. I decided quickly that being drugged at this point wouldn't make much of a difference, and did as I was told and took the mug from her. It was filled with a thick, dark liquid. I crinkled my nose. The substance smelled of herbs, spices, and something rich that I couldn't place. I took a sip. Wow, this is actually really good. What is it? One of the doctor's famous recipes, and they work wonders, she said. Well, I'd better go. I'll make sure to tell Roland that you're awake when he gets back. After she left, I placed the mug on the nightstand and slid delicately to the side of the bed, being mindful of my bandaged leg. I flinched when my bare feet had made contact with the floor. I walked stiffly into the restroom. It was clean and depersonalized. I opened the small mirror above the porcelain sink. Rust marks tackled the metal shelves that showed where things had been not long ago. I stared into the mirror and inspected my face as I tore the bandage from my cheek. When I turned my head, however, the area where that demon had sliced me looked more like a small scratch. The skin around it was still a little tender and pink. How was that even possible? I could have sworn that I received a pretty nasty cut to my face. Well, I'm not going to complain, but the last time I checked I didn't have any special healing powers. Maybe it wasn't as bad as I'd thought. I examined my face and breathed a sigh of relief. At least my face still looked normal. The sound of footsteps broke me out of my thoughts. I was just leaving the restroom when the door opened. Roland rounded the doorway with his hand against the frame. The other was holding a bundle of clothes. 
He looked exhausted. I've never seen him like this before. I felt a pang of guilt run up my spine. I truly believed that I was protecting the ones I loved by keeping my ability a secret, but well, I was wrong. People had died that night. Roland could have died that night. Before he could open his mouth, I pulled him into a hug. My whole body began to shake as I sobbed. I'm so sorry, Roland. Roland hugged me close. Hey, it's all right. You're safe now. There's no need to apologize, Gav. I let him comfort me for a minute before we both broke apart. How did I get here? I brought you here, he answered simply. Wait, but how? There was some... Where? Well, s some animal in there with me. How did you manage to survive? Roland gave me an apprehensive look. That was me, Gav, he said gently. I'm a werewolf. You're a... a t <laughs> what? I said, perplexed as I struggled to really understand what Roland had just told me. But I would have known, right? All these years that I've known him, I would have seen some sort of sign in it. It wasn't like I was ignorant of the real world or what was really out there. I knew demons existed, so I was always open to the possibility of other supernatural beings, especially after witnessing a full-on werewolf versus demon showdown that night. But knowing a werewolf personally felt so surreal. I'm telling you the truth, he said. Why, why would you lie about something like that? I asked. I immediately felt like a hypocrite as soon as the accusation left my lips. I was so upset at Roland for keeping a secret from me when that's exactly what I'd been doing. My not-so-righteous indignation drained out of me and I walked over to the edge of the bed and sat down. Roland took a moment before he came over. He placed the clothes on the table and sat down beside me. I didn't actually lie to you, he refuted slowly. I just omitted certain parts of the truth. Those are some big omissions, Roland, I said. Yeah, all right, but I swear to you that nothing was an out-and-out -out lie. He noticed the look on my face and frowned. Please, Gavin, don't be afraid of me. I'd never hurt you. Then he glanced down at my calf. Yeah, I swear that was an accident. I felt the demon was still out there and I panicked. I held up a hand. Look, I believe you. I'm just trying to process all of this. Why didn't you tell me? Well, I'm uh, bound by lichen laws, he explained. But you deserve to know because of what happened that night. Oh, makes sense, I guess. So, where am I? I asked. Well, you're in a hospital. Really? I asked as I glanced around. It doesn't look like many mundane hospital I've seen. Well, uh, that's because it isn't. This place is an institution that provides medical treatment for sick or injured, um, supernatural beings like me. You know how my mom's a nurse? Oh, yeah, she works here and sometimes I volunteer once in a while, he stated. We even have transportation and daycare, among other things. He's serious, I asked. What if a human were to accidentally walk in? Well, they wouldn't be able to, Roland said. There's a glamour over the whole building, so humans would only see a private business. That's a whole thing. That's pretty cool, but then why am I here? Well, I'm human. Before Roland could answer, my stupid leg bumped against the nightstand, eliciting a curse from me. Look, I can fix that, Roland said. He jerked his chin toward my bandaged calf. Your leg? I can heal that. The injuries caused by my can tend to take a little longer to heal. How? I asked. Just relax, Roland said gently. He carefully lifted my leg and placed it over his lap. He rolled up his left sleeve and reached into his pocket and took out a small knife. Oh, oh, hold on, what are you doing? I panicked as I tried to pull away, but his grip was strong, unnaturally strong. He glanced over at me as he removed the bandage. I grimaced as I saw the three large claw marks. Relax, Gavin he repeated. He took the blade and sliced his palm open. Blood pooled and dripped down from the wound. He carefully placed his hand on my leg. And then I felt it, a strange, warm sensation spread around the area. My first reaction was to grab my leg and hiss, but I fought to keep myself still. Are you okay? Roland asked. 
you just sliced your hand open and placed it on my leg like some weird blood oath, but yeah, it doesn't hurt at least, I said. A feeling like having my leg wake up from falling asleep spread slowly around it like pins and needles as the skin beneath his hand closed. The sensation eased and then disappeared completely. What was that? I gaped at him. It's called pain transference, he explained as he released my leg. We werewolves have the ability to absorb the pain of others and even heal them by our saliva or blood. Pretty neat, eh? Um, yeah. Uh, hold on. I'm not a werewolf now, right? I asked. Roland chuckled and shook his head. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. Humans turning are very rare. Did it hurt at all? You know, when you... When I healed you. You leaned back slightly. Uh, not really, but it depends on the severity of the injury. I'm guessing you've worked with worse, huh? I asked. Yep, yeah, I have, and I'd happily do it again, he said. You're a masochist, I scoffed. Rodan laughed, and I felt a smile begin to tug at the edge of my lips. Hang on, what about this one on my cheek? I pointed to the light scratch. I could have sworn it looked pretty bad, and now it looks almost completely healed. Roland got close, and his brows knitted together. Are you sure? I mean, it didn't look that bad when I brought you here. Damn, I was kind of hoping to have supernatural healing powers. That would have been awesome. Okay, okay, well, maybe I was just... Suddenly the reality of what had happened came back to me, and I stared down at my newly healed leg. Hey, um, Roland, what happened to their bodies? I asked slowly. Roland sighed and took a few moments before he spoke. After what had transpired, he was able to get a hold of his father. Whomever his father had called, they'd taken care of it. He didn't go into too much detail, but whatever these people did, they were able to make it look like a car accident. Even though lying to their families didn't really sit right with me, I was relieved that the bodies of Jasper and Shelby were found and their families would be able to give them proper burials. I asked about Arian, the real Arian, but he just told me that her body was never found, as far as he knew. God, this must all be so much to take in. I bet you feel like everything's going to hell in a handbasket, he said. I looked away from him. To a normal person, it had seemed that way, but I've been dealing with it since I was a child. What do you mean? Roland cocked his head. I've been able to sense demons ever since my parents' deaths, but now for some reason it's getting harder to control. That night the demon said it needed to take me alive, but I don't know why. Jesus, Gav. I didn't know, he said. No one did. I mean, who would have believed me? Well, I believe you, Roland said as he patted my shoulder. So will my father. Oh, that reminds me. After you're dressed, he wants to see us. My eyes widened. Elijah? Roland nodded. Yeah, he's the pack leader. Well, of course he was. Who else but Roland's imposing father would be the alpha werewolf? Roland and I left after hours. Part of me was curious as to what kinds of supernatural creatures they had for patients, but Roland decided that we should go out the back door. After an hour, we pulled up to the edge of the property line. Before we continued down the road, Roland turned to face me. All right, Gavin, I need you to listen to me very carefully. Um, yeah, sure. I said warily. Whatever you see, just don't panic. You're safe here, he said. Uh, I won't, I said. I doubted that I convinced him since I didn't even convince myself. I briefly wondered if his wolfy senses could detect dishonesty, but I didn't ask. Are you sure? He said skeptically. You look a little shaken. Look, if it'll make you feel any better, don't look out the window he said as he began to drive down the road. Well, curiosity got the better of me, and I turned to look outside, and I instantly regretted it. Several pairs of amber eyes watched us as we made our way down the road. I quickly averted my eyes. Street lamps lined the road as we drove deeper into the woods. The beasts that were lurking in the trees had vanished, but the feeling of being watched stayed. There were a few cabins that I could see scattered throughout the trees, and dirt paths trailed between them. 
They were spread out, and some of them looked well lived in, with small gardens filled with a variety of little trinkets. We pulled up in front of a massive lodge overlooking the lake. Oh, even though I've known Roland and his parents for years, never once had I visited this place. His parents were like family to me, and now that I think about it, I kind of felt a bit hurt that the ones I trusted didn't seem to trust me with this until now, but I also understood that they had their reasons. I kept close to him as we made our way up the steps. The doors to the lodge were heavy oak, carved with beautiful forest panels. Roland grabbed his keys and unlocked the doors. The doors opened up into a large room with a high ceiling. A chandelier made out of deer antlers hung in the centre. Comfortable-looking chairs and cushions sat around a wide circular table in the centre of the room. There were also leather couches in front of a marble fireplace mounted into the wall. The floor was some sort of shiny stone, maybe granite. There was a staircase leading up to the second floor. The whole place seemed well lived in. This is where my father holds pack meetings. The hallway through the doors to the left leads to the kitchen, and upstairs is where my family sleeps. There's twenty of us in my father's pack, and some actually live here, he explained. I was about to say something when someone entered in from the kitchen. The guy looked to be about our age, with shoulder-length dirty blonde hair, pale skin, and green eyes that were narrowed in my direction. He crossed his arms over his chest. Emery, Roland said as he moved closer to me. Do you know where my fa- You should have called, Roland. The guy, Emery, scowled. Roland sighed, clearly annoyed. I already informed my father. One of the demons had some ability to cut service to our cell phones. There wasn't any time to come up with a plan. Emery ignored him and took a few steps forward and jerked his chin in my direction. You even exposed yourself to a human. You of all Werkin should know better. Roland suddenly bared his teeth at Emery, and I could have sworn that his eyes turned an amber color. I told you that I had no other choice, he growled. Emery's eyes also seemed to bleed amber, but he took a step back. For some reason they were after him and were ordered to bring him back alive. And my father wants to know why. You've got to be joking, right? Emery scoffed. Why the hell would demons want a human kid and a weak looking one at that? I've had a prickle of annoyance at this asshat's insult. I'm 21, actually. I said calmly. Don't insult me again. If you haven't figured it out, I've had a really bad couple of days. Is that a threat? Emery growled. Back off, Em, Roland warned with a growl of his own. He managed to wound one of them, and he fought to stay alive long enough for me to get to him. No. Emery's face tightened. You're the one who... Enough. A booming voice filled the room, dripped with authority. The three of us paused, and Roland and I turned around. Elijah and his wife Natalie eyed us from the entryway. Natalie was tall and slender, but was still inches shorter than Roland. Her open hair spun in ringlets past her pale skin. Her hazel eyes relaxed as they settled on mine. Elijah was a tall, muscular, dark-skinned man with short black hair speckled with grey. His dark brown eyes narrowed. Even though Elijah's physique was imposing, he was a really cool guy if you knew him personally. I guess as the alpha male, he had to be fierce, stern, and at times deadly. The realization that Roland, my best friend, was a werewolf really brought a definite undercurrent of excitement. The heart-stopping terror that had happened a few nights ago faded into interest, into thrilling newness like playing a new game for the first time or unlocking an achievement. Only better, because this was real. Also scarier, because this was real. Elijah cleared his throat. I'm going to talk with Garen, he says. Alone, he added, firmly when Roland began to follow. Emery left first, not even giving me a second glance. Natalie gave me a quick hug. Oh my goodness, I'm so relieved that you're alright, love. Roland, sweetie, I'll need your help with something in the shed she said as she headed toward the kitchen. Roland gave me a reassuring smile and followed his mother. Come and sit down, Gavin, Elijah invited. Well, I still felt slightly irritated after everything that had just happened to me. Being angry was easier than being upset, but Elijah didn't deserve either from me. 
I sat down on the couch near the fireplace. A lump formed in my throat and I placed my head in my hands. I'm sorry, I apologized. I didn't mean to cause any inconvenience. Elijah sat down next to me and placed a hand on my shoulder. I don't blame you, son. You've been through a hell of a lot, he stated calmly. Is there anything I can get you? Something to drink? I smiled weakly and shook my head. No, I'm fine, thank you. I just don't know what I'm going to do now. Elijah leaned forward and clasped his hands together. Well, perhaps you could tell me what happened. The demons that you and Roland dealt with. Was that the first time you've seen a demon? No, not like that. I mean, I've been aware of their presence ever since I was a child. Elijah asked me to elaborate. He listened very carefully as I spilled the beans and he never took his eyes off mine. Elijah's brows knitted together. I know that this next question may be personal, but I need you to answer if you can. I nodded. Did anyone in your family have this ability? Your mother or father, perhaps? Well, no, not that I can remember. I mean, my family were completely normal, I answered. Are you sure? A little voice whispered in my head. You were only a child when your parents died. You were barely old enough to know anything about them. Elijah pursed his lips. Normal people, well, uh, you were very young when your parents died, so it's likely one of them could have passed his ability to you. However, this is all just speculation on my part. I slumped back against the sofa. He continued. Demons are repulsive beings, and uh, not usually known for keeping a human alive unless it's to possess them. This situation is truly very odd. Or maybe it's because of what I can do, and they don't like that, I added. And they want to know how I'm doing it. Elijah patted me on the shoulder again and stood up. That's a uh, definite possibility. Do you think it's safe for me to go home? I asked. Elijah shook his head, concerned. No, at least not until I have someone go over and check the house. We have a guest room available for you. Even though Elijah used to own the house... I wasn't at all sure I wanted someone I didn't know in my home, but there was no reason for me not to trust him. I was just being paranoid. Surprisingly, the last question that came out was, Why did you allow Roland and I to become friends? I mean, weren't you worried that I'd find out the truth about you? And there were a few in the pack who believed it wasn't a wise decision, but if some of us are to live among humans, we can't shut ourselves off from them entirely. We even have methods of concealing ourselves. He said. Now I'll have someone take you to your room. Tomorrow I shall do what I can to find out why demons have taken such an interest in you. I nodded. And I suddenly longed for those days when I pretended to live in ignorance. After what had happened that night, I'd probably never feel safe again. Part 3 when I woke up the next morning, I could hear birds chirping from outside my window, but I didn't immediately open my eyes. I merely sighed as I sank deeper into the fluffy comforter and very luxurious soft mattress, but the memories from the day before caused me to squint one eye open. I lifted my head and surveyed the room. Soft sunlight filed in through sheer drapes. In the light, the guest bedroom seemed light and airy. The white furniture and grey walls were a nice contrast. There was an alarm clock that showed it was mid-morning, and I noticed that there was a note beside it. Went out to buy some groceries. There were clean clothes and a towel in the bathroom. Roland. I set the note back down on the nightstand and got out of bed. I showered, and the hot water felt great against my skin. Once I was done getting dressed, I made my way over to the bedroom door. The hallway outside my room was empty, and I would have guessed that there was no one home if not for the smell of someone cooking. I closed the door behind me and slowly walked down the stairs toward the kitchen. The kitchen was big, just like the rest of the house. The cabinets were painted grey and the counters were a light, polished wood, and the backsplash was alternating top and black mosaic tiles. Roland had his back to me, taking something out of the oven. He swiveled his head around like he'd already known that I was standing there the whole time. He probably did. Ah, good morning, Gaff. I made breakfast pizza, your favourite. How are you feeling? 
I scratched the back of my head and shrugged. I took a seat at the table and poured myself some coffee. Oh, definitely better than yesterday. I looked around and noticed that Roland and I were the only ones eating breakfast. So, uh, where's everyone else? Oh, my mom took an early shift at work and my dad has a meeting around one. He explained as he came over. He placed the pizza on the table and a bottle of ranch. <laughs> he knew me so well. And I happily grabbed two slices. I realized right then that I was absolutely ravenous. Damn, hungry, aren't you? Roland smiled in amazement. That medicine from the hospital should have kept you satisfied enough, but you're acting like you hadn't eaten at all. I don't know, I said between mouthfuls. Guess I'm just really hungry. You gonna eat? Nah, I already had breakfast earlier, he said. Maybe you should chew your food. I don't want you to choke. I swallowed and pointed my half-eaten slice of pizza at him. A piece of egg fell off of it. I blame you for making this one of my favorite foods. God, you're an amazing cook. <laughs> for making something so quick and easy? He laughed. Yeah. I dipped my slice of pizza in the ranch. Also, you're the only one who usually cooks our meals at home anyway. Oh, that's true. What would you do without me? He smirked. Well, I don't know. Get murdered by demons? I said. When I saw the smirk on Roland's face dip into a frown, I immediately regretted it. I placed the slice of pizza on the plate. Okay, that was in bad taste, but at the same time, it's the truth. If you hadn't got there when you did, I don't know what would have happened. Well, you don't have to worry about that. You're here with me and you're safe. It'll be okay, right? How? I thought to myself. How's it going to be okay? This isn't some video game or a horror film where everything is play pretend. This is real life. I mean, normal humans don't defeat demonic beings in real life. They die. I wasn't equipped for this. As far as I knew, I didn't have any awesome superpowers, and before anyone says anything, being able to sense demons is not an awesome superpower. It's a curse, and because of it, people had died. People had died because I played ignorant. Well, maybe if I was smarter, more careful, and kept to myself, none of this would have happened. Hey! Roland snapped his fingers lightly, breaking me out of my thoughts about how unfair my life was. Stop that. I can practically hear you thinking. As I was saying, while you were sleeping, my father was able to get into contact with someone that might be able to help. Really? I asked, and my posture straightened. Who is it? This guy named Mort. He wants us to meet him at his place after breakfast, Roland explained. Oh, and I was meaning to give these back to you. Well, I kind of forgotten. You seemed exhausted, so I decided to wait until you woke up. He walked out of the kitchen for a moment and then came back with a black box. The box that held the blade he got for me for my birthday. And laying right next to it was my phone. A wave of relief washed over me as I brushed my fingers over the blade. I thought I'd never get it back. Roland... You're seriously the bestest best friend ever, I said with gratitude. <laughs> I know, he smiled. It was around one when we grabbed an Uber and headed out to meet this Mort. Roland told me that his mother was borrowing the Jeep since her car was in the shop. Through the thick brush that bordered the driveway, a small red house came into view. This is the place, the driver announced. Roland thanked the lady and slung his duffel bag over his shoulder. As the car drove away, we walked up to the house. Roland took the lead and stepped up to the door and knocked twice. Hmm, how long was it appropriate to wait on a stranger's porch? I wondered. As far as I knew, Elijah told him that we were coming ahead of time so this guy should be home. I was just about to suggest that Roland ring the doorbell when I heard the door unlock from the other side. A short, plump man with blue eyes and dark, mousy hair greeted us. Yes? he said in a gruff voice. I'm Roland and this is Gavin. My father Elijah told you we were coming. Mort eyed the two of us almost warily. Then he nodded and opened the door wide enough for us to come inside. The home was compact with a small kitchen to the right and a bedroom straight ahead. The living area was small, cluttered with papers, books and other various items. A flat screen TV hung above the mantel. Mort motioned us to the couch next to a coffee table which had a large plate of mini sandwiches and tea. 
He sat across from us in a cushioned chair. Please help yourselves, Mort said. I grabbed one of the sandwiches from the plate. Even after two slices of breakfast pizza, I was still kind of hungry. Wow, these are delicious, I commented. The cucumber had just the right amount of mayonnaise and pepper, and I decided to take two more and put them on a small paper plate, shamelessly. Mort gave me a smile. Roland sipped his tea and took a bite from his sandwich. I took a large gulp of tea and reached over to carefully put my empty cup back on its saucer. I'd barely let go of the handle before Mort pounced on it, snatched it away and peered into it intently. I sat back into the sofa. Hey, if you see the Grim, don't tell me, I said. I don't want to know. Roland placed his cup down and leaned forward as Mort examined the cup and scowled with frustration. Yeah, that's odd. There's nothing for me to read here. Wait, uh, you're a fortune teller, I asked. I glanced at Roland, who shrugged and took another sandwich from the plate. Mort ignored my question, clearly annoyed. Ah, the images are jumbled, meaningless. Then he glanced up at me. I wonder, is there possibly a block on your mind? Roland paused mid-bite into his sandwich, and I just blinked at Mort. Um, probably. <laughs> this rate, nothing had surprised me. Mort and Roland exchanged a puzzled glance then looked away sharply upon recognizing their moment of commiseration. Oh, okay, I don't actually know what that means, I added. A block, I mean. Mort sat back and said, It's a very advanced spell that could have different effects. It's possibly the type of spell used to conceal away certain memories or even abilities. Thought about it for a moment. I mean, that kind of made sense. Maybe it was the former. And if that's the case, then why? What about the memory was so bad that it had to be concealed? Well, the thought was intensely disturbing. But I don't know how it would have gotten there. Another thought occurred to me. Is there anything you can do? Mort shook his head, unsatisfied. No, this is beyond me, but you're in luck. I happen to know someone who might be able to help you. He reached into his pocket and took out his phone. Like who? I asked. His name's Rysan, Maud answered, as he scrolled through his phone at what I assumed was his contacts. His powers are of the mind. If what I assume is true, he'll be able to undo whatever was done to you. Roland frowned. I've heard of him. He's kind of creepy, to be honest. Ignoring Roland's comment, I said, So what you're saying is that he can read minds? Well, that doesn't actually sound too bad. To be fair, I'd rather have someone mess around in my head for a missing memory than be dissected on some metal slab as some demonic science experiment. Mort paced around as he talked rather animatedly on the phone. It was evident that whoever was on the other end was someone Mort admired. After he was done, he came over and sat back down. I have someone coming to pick you two up in about 30 minutes, he stated. Half an hour later, we heard a car pull up the driveway. Mort got up from the chair and, without hesitation, he opened the door. A young woman with shoulder-length black hair, brown eyes, and pale skin stood in the doorway. She wore a faded purple sweatshirt that was too big for her petite frame, with a picture of an anime I couldn't name. It almost ended right below the waist of her thin, albeit comfortable-looking black pants. She wore a leg holster strapped to her right thigh. I eyed the gun tucked inside for a brief moment, before meeting her eyes. She looked at Mort and smiled. Hey, what's up, Mort? It's been a while, she said, and pulled him into a hug. Yes, Layla, it has. You need to visit more often. It's lonely around here, Mort said. When I find time, you'll be the first one I call. So, um, these are the ones you told me about? She held out her hand for me to take, and I shook it tentatively. It's nice to meet you two. You ready to head out? I think Mort saw hesitation in my face because he said, Layla is one of Rysan's personal assistants and a long-time friend of mine. I trust her with my life. Layla just rolled her eyes. You seriously give me too much praise, Mort. And she blushed. Roland grabbed his duffel bag and turned to look at me. You ready to do this, Gav? He asked. I nodded. 
Mort placed his hand on my arm. Hold on, you two. I want to give you something before you go. He walked over to the fireplace and grabbed a small grey box with pretty carvings on it from on top of the mantel. He came back over to us and removed the lids. He took out two tiny octagonal shaped charms with a weird symbol on both sides. They hung on a silver chain to be worn as a necklace. What are they? I asked. Roland took his out and put it on and tucked it underneath his shirt. They're charms imbued with a protection spell. Keep them on your person. Don't lose them. After we said our goodbyes, Roland and I followed Layla to her Civic parked outside. So, uh, how long do you estimate we'll be on the road for? Roland asked as he placed his duffel under him. Well, about seven days by car, Layla replied. But, she quickly added when she noticed the are you serious look on my face. Why well, say screw that noise? I know a better way that'll get us there in no time at all. What does that even mean? I asked. Oh, you're talking about a portal, right? Roland exclaimed. I turned to him, open mouthed. Holy crap. Wait, are you serious? No freaking way. Well, that's exactly right. Layla nodded. She made a right turn and took the ramp to the freeway. I noticed that we were leaving town. Once we were off the freeway, I noticed they were renting somewhere outside of town that was empty and desolate. I don't know why, but I got an eerie feeling of being watched, even as we drove by. Layla pulled up to the curb and turned off the engine right next to an old subway entrance. We're here, she announced, as the three of us got out. She threw her backpack over her shoulder and placed the key on the dashboard and locked the car. Hold on, what are you doing? I asked. I couldn't believe it. She's really going to leave this car here, out in the open, with the key inside. What do you mean? We won't be needing it anymore. Layla started towards the stairs. Come on, let's go. When we got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw Layla standing with her hand on her hip in front of a wall of graffiti-covered plywood that blocked the entrance. The place seemed abandoned, and by the looks of the aged wood, this place had been closed for a long time. She reached towards the wall with one hand, grabbed one of the boards and gave it a tug. It didn't seem like she gave it much effort at all, but instantly the boards pulled loose in one piece and it opened up an avenue into the station. I assumed at one time this used to be a busy station. I envisioned people waiting to board the train. I glanced to my right and I could make out an ornate mosaic tile on the walls that arched up toward the ceiling. Parts of it were covered in various advertisements, which were either torn or faded with age. There was garbage everywhere, and benches were overturned, and the thin glass around the booths was shattered and covered in spray paint and cobwebs. Layla walked over to the wide wall between the tracks. She opened her bag and took out a small bottle and sprayed silver mist onto a section of the wall that revealed a circular keyhole with weird-looking designs. This is it. She placed the bottle back into her bag. This is... Suddenly, Roland stood rigid in place. Someone's coming this way, he whispered. Without saying anything, Layla kicked her bag underneath one of the benches and drew out her gun from its holster. She motioned for us to hide. A minute later, I saw it. A slouched-over figure dressed in thick brown and grey clothing moving out of the shadows. His face was caked in dry blood, framed by shaggy brown hair. His eyes were bright blue like the hottest part of the flame, and he flexed his long, bony fingers as his crusty lips curled back to show his razor-sharp teeth. Without a second thought, he lunged for her. She quickly dodged him and attempted to shoot him, but he dodged that in return. His next blow caught her off guard and she stumbled, just barely keeping her balance. He took that opportunity to grab her wrist and he squeezed hard. The pressure of his hold forced her to drop her gun. He kicked it away and it fell onto the tracks. He leaned in behind her and grinned from ear to ear. Remember me? He growled. Samuel! Layla replied with a frown. Who the hell was Samuel? You smelled so delicious and you're quite the fighter. I like that. I just knew that I had to have you, so I followed you. 
I'm going to have some fun with you, and then... Samuel put his mouth to her ear, and his words were too quiet for me to hear in on his conversation, but the expression on Layla's face told me enough. I'm not edible, Jagoff, she grimaced. Perhaps not a full meal, but maybe a light snack, I think. He crooned as he licked his lips. No, I mean you would literally regret it, she said. I'd give you a bad case of indigestion. Now that's no way to treat a lady, said a deep, masculine voice from the other end of the station. And the voice was cold and menacing. Samuel moved so he was facing the source of the voice. What the hell? Who's there? Who are you? The voice chuckled. There's really no need for introductions, and I'd hate to waste time on the formalities with someone who's already dead. The shadow shifted and a tall shape moved forward into the lights. He was a lean man with light blonde hair and bright green eyes. He wore black pants and a black long-sleeved shirt, and over them he wore some kind of leather harness that crisscrossed his chest, holding an assortment of blades and other carry-on weapons. He even had a gun strapped to his thigh just like Layla. Don't get cocky, you bastard, Samuel spat. Stay back or I'll rip her apart like cotton candy. He slid his hand to her throat. His claws dug into her skin while his other hand stayed behind her back. Oh, that's a bit melodramatic, don't you think? The man quipped. He took a step forward and then another. Fine, Samuel hissed. Her death will be on your hands. Before the man reached them, Samuel brought back his arm and plunged his hand through Layla's back with a sickening sound, crushing bone and ripping past flesh and muscle. I watched in absolute horror as her eyes rolled back in her head and her chest split open. Her body gave one last twitch and then hung limp. Samuel retracted his arm and held her steaming, sopping wet heart in his hand with a smug and hungry look on his face. I clenched my hands into fists. My nails bit into my palms and I felt a sickening drop in my stomach. Damn it. I couldn't do anything but watch. Samuel casually took a bite out of it, and the blood ran freely down his chin. He smiled and dropped the organ onto the ground. He tossed her body in our direction like discarded trash. Her body slammed into the broken wall we were hiding behind. Layla's dead-eyed stare made my heart lurch. I felt a scream fall in my throat, but Roland quickly clamped a hand over my mouth. The man in the vest narrowed his eyes. Now it's your turn. Between the both of you, I'll have food to last me a week. He lunged forward, but before he could land a single blow, something jerked Samuel backwards. A black miasma took shape right behind him on the ground. Four unnaturally long, pale arms wrapped themselves tightly around him as a slender, naked woman, well, I think it was a woman, rose from out of the darkness. Her face was blanketed by long strands of black hair. Suddenly, Samuel released an ear-piercing screech that reverberated all around us. Roland and I plugged our ears and groaned in pain, but I managed to watch as the woman's bony fingers dug into his flesh. He clawed at her desperately, but it was futile. His flesh started to steam as it twisted and withered away. Blood seeped out of every orifice and pooled on the ground beneath them. His scream died and his body went limp. The woman pulled her arms away from him, and his body collapsed. This creepy, four-armed woman disappeared back into the shadows. I blinked. What the fuck was that thing? Holy crap, that was scary as hell. The man grimaced and walked over to the dry husk that used to be Samuel, and reached into his pouch. From it he produced a small yellow vial. With a deft motion he poured the vial's contents over the body and then stepped back. Where the drops had hit its corpse, black smoke began to curl away. The smoke quickly spread horizontally until it cocooned the body entirely. In a few seconds, the smoke dissipated, leaving an innocuous pile of dust behind. You two can come out now, the man said. It's safe. I was sent by my boss, Rice and Winters. I perked up at the name. Though I hesitated, thinking that staying hidden was a better option, well... What if that grudge-looking thing is still around? 
I don't want my skin to dry up like a prune. Is it a trap? Roland placed a hand on my shoulder and gave me a reassuring nod and stood up. It's fine, Gav. He's telling the truth. All right, whatever you say. I stood up from our hiding place, but, but before I could move away from the wall, I felt something tug at my pant leg. I glanced down and panicked. Holy shit, what, what the fuck? I babbled, almost incoherently. Layla squeezed my ankle while her other hand came up to her face just in case I decided to kick at her. Hey, stop that. Just calm down, will you? How the hell am I supposed to calm down, you freaking zombie? Oh my god, did this mean zombies exist? Roland quickly pulled me away from her and she slowly sat upright and groaned. Ah, oh, god, that fucking sucked. That was my favorite sweatshirt, too. She glared up at me. And I'm not a zombie, okay? Just relax. Ah, oh, so you're finally awake, the man said. He sauntered over and picked something up from the ground and examined it. Hey, Layla snapped at him. Quit playing with my heart, Oliver. Give it here. The man, Oliver, rolled his eyes and tossed the organ to Layla, who caught it easily. Be careful, you jerk. She unzipped her backpack and took out a jar. She placed her heart into it and placed it back into her bag. She took out a black jacket and put it over her sweatshirt to hide the gaping hole in her chest. She turned around and stomped over to the pile of dust. Damn it, Oliver. I really wanted to kill him. She pouted. Then she glanced down. Oh yeah, my gun. She hopped down to grab her gun off the tracks as if she hadn't just had her heart ripped out of her chest a moment ago. Clearly that wasn't going to happen. Oliver scoffed. Oh, you're welcome, by the way. Layla flipped him the bird as she climbed back onto the platform. Okay, um, seriously, what the hell was that? I exclaimed. My job, Oliver stated simply. Okay, fine, keep your secrets, I thought. He took something small from his pocket. It was a key similar to Layla's. He placed the key into the keyhole and placed his other hand on the circle and moved it to a 90 degree angle, and then he pushed it in. For a moment, nothing happened. And then something, actually many somethings, clicked and slid into place on the other side. The wall in front of us cracked and popped as it began to ripple with bursting light. So cool, I breathed. Let's go. Oliver placed the key back into his pocket and without another word he stepped through. I watched as the light swirled. Something smelled good. The three of us stepped through the swirling ominous warmth, leaving the abandoned train station behind. Part 4 Raisa I stared wide-eyed as I took in my surroundings of this bustling city around us. I turned around, but the portal that the four of us had come through was now just a normal brick wall covered in advertisements and old chewing gum. The only sign that there had been a mystical doorway at all was the swirling pieces of discarded trash disturbed by our immediate arrival. Where exactly are we? I asked. Seattle, Oliver answered, as he grabbed something, a black jacket, from Layla's bag and put it on. He led us down the narrow alleyway onto the main street. Let's head over to Odessa's. Raisan hasn't replied back and I'm starving. I have a few questions, I whispered to Layla as we headed down the street. What happened to your car and how the hell did we just come out of a wall without anyone noticing? Well, someone's been sent to collect it. And to answer your other question, Oliver placed a temporary glamour over us as we stepped through the portal. I was completely invisible, I thought, as I glanced down at myself. Half an hour later, the four of us stood in front of a restaurant. The sign bearing its name tilted a slight angle. Layla stretched her arms wide with enthusiasm. Welcome to the greatest restaurant in the whole city, she declared proudly. It didn't look that spectacular, to be honest, but I didn't say anything. It was a quaint place and brightly lit, which illuminated the snug booths lined with comfortable cushions that flanked the wall across the kitchen and open bar. A gorgeous girl around my age with pink hair and blue eyes waved at us. 
She placed a pen and notepad inside the pocket of her black and blue spotless uniform and handed the four of us menus, gesturing for us to sit wherever we liked. Oliver and Layla moved so unhesitantly to one of the open booths at the very back that I realized that this was a regular pit stop for them. Roland and I shared a look and then followed after them. Oliver slid into the booth and Roland and I were in the seat across from him. I'm going to use the restroom real quick, Layla stated. I'll be right back. I watched as she twirled on her heels and headed over to where the pink-haired girl was. The two of them disappeared behind a black curtain that read, Staff Only. I wondered what all that was about. Maybe she knew the girl personally or something. A tall, busty woman with thick, curly brown hair and bright amber-colored eyes arrived with four glasses of water and silverware. Good evening. My name's Lucinda and I'll be your server tonight. Oh, it's nice to see you again, Oliver, she said cheerfully. Oliver smiled. Ah, good evening, Lucy. As the two conversed, I noticed up close that her smile was full of sharp, needle-like teeth. I quickly averted my eyes to the menu in front of me. And she turned her attention back on her notepad. So, what would you like to start with? Uh, coffee, please. Oliver placed his menu down in front of him. Black, I want a strawberry lemonade for my partner, he added. I'll have a raspberry iced tea, Roland said. Um, I'll have the same thing, please. Uh, sure thing, she smiled as she scribbled it all down. Should I give you more time to browse your menu, or are you ready to order? Yeah, I'm ready, Oliver said. I'll get my usual, the same for my partner. I'll have the skillet steak dinner, medium, with a side of onion rings. Roland smiled at her as he placed his menu on top of Oliver's. Well, she nodded and turned to me. I noticed that her eyes changed from amber to solid white, no pupils at all. What about you, sweetheart? I glanced down at the items, which I barely had time to look at. My fingers tightened on the menu in order to keep my hands from shaking. My eyes widened and I did a double take as I scanned each of the items. There were various kinds of meals that were oh, rather worldly, but not apparently anything normal. Uh, why had Roland seen the snake and onion rings? Lucinda grinned. Oh, don't worry, sweetheart. Human food's on the back. Oh, thanks. I turned the menu over and, without thinking, I chose the first thing I saw. I'll just have the chicken Caesar wrap with a side of steak fries, please. Sure thing, Lucinda purred and collected all of our menus. I'll take these and be right back with your drink. Layla returned from behind the curtain and slid back in beside Oliver. She placed her bag beneath the table and combed her fingers through her hair. I noticed that she'd changed clothes. She'd switched out of her faded sweatshirt for a green blouse under a black leather jacket. Under her blouse, right over the sternum, was a long diagonal scar, light against her dark skin. Well, she must have caught me staring because she laughed and said, It's all right. You can ask me the question I know you're dying to ask. When I didn't say anything right away, she sighed and touched the scar. Okay, well, I'll explain it anyway. So, in short, I underwent an experimental treatment using a serum mixed with axotl DNA, giving me superhuman healing abilities, she said. This scar will be completely gone by tomorrow. Well, I'm kind of like Deadpool, but without the terminal cancer and permanent scarring. Well, um, that's pretty awesome, actually. I just have one question. What are you going to do with it? I hesitated, struggling to find the words that wouldn't turn things awkward between us. Um, you know, um, your heart in a jar. Well, that, my friend, is classified information. She smiled, tucking a loose strand of hair behind her ear. Anyway, I can always count on Braden to have an extra pair of clothes for me if I need them. Although it really sucks that I couldn't save my sweatshirt. Well, you should start wearing your uniform, Layla. I'm tired of hearing you whine. Remember what happened the last time? Yeah, yeah, I know, but the uniform they gave me is too small, and moving around in it is a pain in the ass. I've sent the Bureau another request, but I have to wait a few more days until the new one arrives. She huffed. Also, it's not like I really need a uniform anyway. Um, 
uniform? I asked curiously. I didn't think that the tight black shirt and pants Oliver was wearing was an actual uniform. Of course, Layla said. Our uniforms are made with very special fibers, which makes them almost indestructible to most attacks. Well, I think of them as supernatural bulletproof vests. That's actually pretty freaking awesome, I exclaimed. I know, right? She smiled. Okay, now I'm curious, Roland said as he sat back in his seat. What happened the last time? Oh, Oliver and I were hunting a wendigo spotted up in the mountains a few months back. And uh, I chose to be the bait, she answered him simply. You know, it really sucks being without a body. It makes self-preservation much more difficult. Then she turned her head toward Oliver with a large smile. Hey, next time I'm ripped apart, you have to take a picture of what my insides look like. Holy crap. This girl was insane. Definitely more of a masochist than Roland was with his ability to heal others. Oliver rolled his eyes and for a split second I could have sworn I saw a ghost of a smirk on his face. Oh, you're so weird, he said, and took a sip of his coffee. Yeah, but you're used to it, Layla laughed. So, um, what's your ability, Oliver? I asked, and immediately cursed myself for being so nosy. Oliver turned to me, but... To my relief, he didn't seem annoyed about it, just a little distant. My ability? Well, I don't necessarily have some supernatural ability of my own. What you witnessed down in the station was Ayaka, a vengeful spirit who's been wandering around the world for centuries, killing and feeding on the essence of monsters, human and cryptid alike. He took a moment before continuing. Well, before I joined the Bureau, I witnessed uh, her ripping into one of my friends who, unbeknownst to me, got away with torturing and murdering a six-year-old girl. Well, for some reason, she took an interest in me, and soon after that, we made a pact. Ayaka's been with me ever since. Oh, what a way to gain a supernatural ability, and a scary one, to be honest. I decided to change the subject. So, um, what is the Bureau, exactly? Why hasn't anyone in the human world proven that the supernatural world exists? <laughs> with the technology we have today, wouldn't there be someone out there with solid proof? I asked. Our food arrived before anyone could reply. Lucinda made her way over with the food and drinks, skillfully balancing them on her arms. Possibly she was using some kind of magic because I couldn't see how else she kept the plates from dropping to the floor as she deftly placed them on the table in front of us. Oh, it looks so good! I'm starving, Layla said. She picked a steak fry between her fingers and dipped it into her buffalo sauce. Roland agreed as he took a bite out of his food. Lucinda smiled. There you go, she said. Can I get you for anything else? We said no and thanked her, and after she left, Oliver took a sip of his coffee and said, Only selected humans around the planet know the truth about the existence of the supernatural world. There are some within the police departments, military, and even the government. He grabbed a fry and bit into it before he continued. And the Bureau of Supernatural Intelligence and Defense, or BSID, takes great measures at keeping the supernatural world secret from the human world. Well, of course, some of them have their own personal reasons for keeping the general populace in the dark. And, as you already know, Layla and I work for the BSID. The BSID has agents, cryptids, and humans with special abilities like Layla and I who are skilled in capturing or killing rogue cryptids. The ones we're able to detain are moved to a special, well-guarded facility someplace away from civilization. So, that guy from the station, what was he? I asked, my head spinning from all of this. A vampire, Roland answered. Correct. Oliver nodded and placed his cup down. Are you serious? Well, I guess that makes sense from what I've seen in the media. Well, most vampires look pretty human, aside from small differences, I said. Oh, that's just a human facade vampires normally use in order to lure in their prey. Oliver shook a fry at me. Their true forms literally resemble bats out of hell. Trust me when I tell you that they're not some undead heartthrob with a tortured soul or any of that bullshit. Huh. 
Vampires are predators, notorious in taking great pleasure in torturing their victims before draining them. So their personalities are pretty much like the vamps from 30 Days and Nights, I said, taking a bite out of my food. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the reasons I enjoyed that film. Layla smiled. Although the vampires in real life could have ripped that entire hall to pieces within seconds. Damn, I said. So, um, when are we going to meet this Rysand? Roland asked. Well, he called me and gave me an update. There's a hotel just a few blocks from here. He booked you to a room already. He figured you two might need a place to stay for the night, Layla replied. He had an important meeting with the BSID, so he won't be back until morning. Well, that's actually pretty nice of him, I said. Mm-hmm. And I'll let you know, this particular hotel provides accommodations and services for supernatural entities only. Uh, don't worry, though. Layla turned to me and smiled clearly amused by my reaction. Yeah, we got you covered. It was a little after nine by the time we made our way towards the hotel. Oliver stayed near the entrance as Layla, Roland and I headed inside. Ah, the place was cozy and warm. There was a large cobblestone fireplace, the wood crackling embers. To our right, there was a decent-sized lounge area opposite the bar. Layla told us to wait in the lobby for a moment and made her way over to the reception desk, where an elderly woman sat, typing away at a computer. My eyes swept the area, and I could immediately tell that most of the patrons looked anything but normal. A few had various shades of skins, others seemed to have a limb or two too many, with extrusions or concavities in their faces. Only a few even looked remotely human, aside from minor differences. A few entities over at the bar glanced over at us with mild interest before going back to their own business. Well, it was probably because I just rewatched Supergirl a few weeks ago, but this kind of place reminded me of Al's dive bar. This was a place where supernatural beings could have a drink and a place to temporarily stay. I smiled, feeling really lucky at that moment to have been given the chance to see this whole other world. An attractive young man around my age with short black hair dipped in crimson-coloured tips, pale skin and bright eyes, sat himself on one side of the bar table. I spotted sharp, jagged teeth protruding from his mouth as he ordered a mojito with a few drops of sangre. Didn't know what sangre was, but I watched as the bartender handed the young man his drink, and with a long black nail he stirred it, the crimson drops mixing in with the liquid. Well, he must have caught me staring at him because he lifted his head up and turned to look at me. He smiled and winked at me. I flushed and averted my gaze to the floor. Holy crap. Roland placed his hand on my shoulder and I met his eyes. Hey, uh, what's the matter with Gav? I think that's actually blood in that guy's you-know-what. <sighs> Never mind. Before Roland could say anything, Layla called for our attention and we made our way over to her. Layla handed us her number just in case we got in any trouble, and with a wave she headed out of the door. The woman behind the desk stood up and studied the two of us. The woman's silver hair was weathered and thin, pulled back tightly in a bun, and her yellow eyes brightened. Ah, good evening, gentlemen. She smiled a toothy, albeit human smile. You're lucky to have booked a room during our busy season. She bent down behind the desk and handed Roland and I each our own keycard, etched with pale green runes. There you are. Enjoy your stay. Roland and I thanked her and took the elevator up to the fourth floor. We made our way down the hallway to our room, reading each door number as we passed. When we came to our room, I reached into my pocket and slid the card into the door lock. The hall light above us turned on automatically, revealing a sizable room with a small balcony overlooking the city. A flat-screen television was mounted on the wall above an oak desk that faced two queen-sized beds with a bathroom to our left and a small kitchen to our right, closest to the door. Roland shrugged off his duffel and placed it on the foot of the bed closest to the window. Uh, since we'll be meeting with Rysand in the morning, we should get some rest, he stated as he unzipped his bag placing two bundles of clothes on the desk. I bought these for you just in case you'd like to clean up. Well, thanks. I appreciate it, man. 
I glanced inside the bag and spotted a few towels and toiletries, a mag light and a black case. So this is what you carry in that duffel bag of yours all the time. What do you think I carried in there? He asked. I stepped away from the bag in order for him to zip it up. I shrugged and scratched my head. I don't know, but I just figured that it must be important since you carry it around everywhere. I take it with me whenever I go out in case I have to... Uh... Wolf out. Yeah, it's a good thing I grabbed it from the jeep last night when we were attacked. Otherwise, I would have waited by the side of the road naked with you unconscious in my arms. I turned away from him and moved to get ready for bed, my cheeks burning. Oh no, I absolutely did not get a mental image of my best friend naked as he carried me out of the forest. Oh no. Falling asleep was difficult. I twisted and turned in the bed. It wasn't that the bed was uncomfortable, but, well, anxiety plagued my mind and I woke up a couple of times in the night, covered in sweat, staring at shadows on the walls. There was a constant buzzing sound from the thermostat that waxed and waned throughout the night. I checked the alarm clock on the nightstand. It read 5.03 a.m. I sighed and sat up. I could see Roland fast asleep with his back to me. I was about to change positions and lay back down when I felt something akin to a headache. It felt like a weird pressure that tugged in the back of my mind like a soft, foreign whisper. I gently pushed away the covers and stood up. I was slowly making my way to the kitchen to grab a glass of water when the headache started to worsen. It started out small and began to throb. I groaned as I placed my hand on my head. Suddenly, I heard a voice. The words entered my head as if they were my own, but they weren't. I tried my best to silence the ominous whispers, but they persisted. Don't be frightened, Gavin. The throbbing headache soon lessened into a warm breeze that travelled through the twists and turns of my mind. I've been expecting you. Come to room 207. As if in some sort of trance, I walked over to the door as the voice beckoned me forward. I quietly turned the knob and opened the door. Well, thankfully, it was empty outside my room, and as if my legs had a mind of their own, I made my way down the hallway. I passed a dozen or so rooms before I came to a stop in front of room 207. Suddenly, I felt like I was in control of my body again. Before I could raise my fist to knock, however, the door swung open. I peeked inside, my eyes sweeping around the room. It was much bigger than the one Roland and I shared. A suite, I assumed. Um, hello? I called from the doorway. Anyone here? Well, your door's open and... Ah, it's nice to finally meet you. A tall, wiry man in his late thirties stepped out of the bedroom and into the light of the small hallway. His long, dark brown hair was streaked silver on one side, partially tied up behind his head. The rest of it draped down his back. He wore a grey, pocket-slim v-neck vest over a black, long sleeve shirt and dark jeans. With curiosity, I stepped further into the room. I could definitely see his face more clearly now. Crow's feet appeared around his pale blue eyes, which looked almost white in the lighting. Suddenly the door swung closed behind me with a gentle click. I immediately panicked. I tried to feel for the door handle while keeping my eyes trained on the man just in case he tried anything. I found it, but before I could turn the knob, the man held up both hands in front of him. It's all right, he said. I mean you no harm. Please come and sit down. I made some coffee. Well, I shook my head. My whole body was itching to open the door and bolt down the hallway. No, thanks. Oh, hold on, don't you want to know why I called you here? I'm sure my assistants have already told you about me. The mention of Layla and Oliver gave me pause. Wait, you're Rysand? The man Rysand nodded. Indeed I am, but you can just call me Rice if you prefer it. I hesitated for a moment before making my way toward the couch, but before I could take a seat, the door was wrenched open and rolled and barged in with messy, wild hair and golden eyes, sharp, almost frightening. He stalked toward Rysand, who stood where he was, seemingly unfazed by Roland's intimidating demeanour. Roland was on the ground, clutching his head in his hands. 
Roland. I pushed past Rysand and made my way over to my friend. Hey, what did you do to him? Your outburst is really unnecessary, Rysand said with a t After whatever power on him broke, Roland cursed under his breath and got to his feet. Unnecessary, he growled out, and his growl rippled across my own flesh due to our proximity, making me shiver. Imagine waking up to an empty room and getting a scent of your friend's distress all the way down the hall. Rysan seemed to consider his explanation for a moment. All right, fair enough. Well, let's start over, shall we? A fire crackled as the three of us sat around a coffee table. Rysan pushed a few piles of books and other various items out of the way, except for a glass globe perched on a small stand in the center. Only it was blank with no continents or oceans mapped out along its curving surface. Rysan must have seen the look on my face because he smiled and placed a hand on top, and the ball started to move. It suddenly came alight. Whoa, that's amazing. I sat forward in my seat to get a closer look. Ah, nice, isn't it? There are only five in existence, he said. The glow within the globe began to separate itself into a three-dimensional sphere as thousands of tiny points appeared and its glass surface disappeared completely. So I've been told you two wanted my help, he said. Tell me everything. I sat back and told him everything that I could remember about the night we were attacked, and he listened calmly all the way through until I mentioned my ability and the block that had been placed inside my head. Rice and still and for a moment I wasn't even sure if he was breathing. Then something flashed across his face. What is it? Roland asked. And instead of answering, Rice and instructed for me to lie down on the chaise long as he brought a stool over and took a seat beside me. I'm going to do a sweep of your mind. You might feel a slight discomfort. Do you trust me? I took a deep breath and nodded. I've come this far. I wasn't about to back out now. Good. Now, calm your mind to the best of your ability. His hands came up to my face, and up close I could see that his hands were inked in elegant, swirling tattoos. And I could feel the power thrumming beneath his slim fingers. It was like an electric charge that was hot and thrilling against my skin. And it suddenly prickled, like invisible talons scraping against something deep within my mind. And it pressed down hard, but it wasn't painful. Well, not really, I realized. And then the pressure was gone and my eyes snapped open. Are you all right, Gaff? How do you feel? Roland asked. He placed a hand behind my back and helped ease me into a sitting position. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I said. Well, my voice sounded a little shaky. I then looked over to Rysand. So, um, is there a way to remove the block in my mind? Rysan knitted his brows together and nodded. Yes, but this one is unique and can only be safely undone by the one who put it there. I sighed heavily. Great. This was turning out to be some kind of damn wild goose chase. You don't have to worry, Gavin, he said, holding up a finger, because I know exactly who placed it there. Who? You. Part 5 Excuse me, but what? I shook my head in disbelief. The room around me was full of shadows cast by the light from the globe on the table. I clutched my head in my hands. Everything inside my head was full of white noise. My processes jammed. Apparently I was capable of creating a strong enough wall that even a powerful mindbreaker like Reese couldn't penetrate. How was I supposed to undo something like this when I didn't even know how I managed to do it in the first place? I was so deep in a tunnel of my own thoughts that I hadn't heard Roland say my name. The world snapped back into place, like a set's backdrop falling into view. My eyes found my friend's hazel ones. He looked concerned. I could tell that he was just as surprised as I was. I turned my attention back to Reese and asked, Okay, so how do we do this? Reese told us to stay seated as he got up from his stool 
and disappeared around the corner to his bedroom. We heard the sound of a closet door opening and things being moved around. A few minutes later he came back and approached me with a tall shot glass and a single decanter. It was a dark green colour with no label and an already loose cork. He filled the thin glass halfway and then handed it to me. This will place you under hypnotic state for about 30 minutes. Please drink this and make yourself comfortable. Roland placed a hand on my shoulder. Gavin, are you sure you want to do this? I need to know what's in my head, Roland. I gave him a reassuring smile. I'll be fine. I hope, I thought to myself as I raised the glass to my face. The crisp and heady scent of apples and mint made me crinkle my nose. I turned back to Reese, looking at him straight in the eyes. If you're seriously wanting to help me, then I'll do it, I said. Just, please, be careful. The sound of my own voice surprised me, firm and clear, completely at odds with a nervous, almost fear-induced feeling in the pit of my stomach. Reese nodded and told me to get comfortable. I placed the shot glass to my lips and tossed it back. I grimaced at the bitter taste and handed it back to him. After I got comfortable, I slowly closed my eyes just as his hands came towards my face. The first brush of contact came instantly, a gentle touch like the sweep of a feather against my mind. When I opened my eyes again, I noticed that I was standing in the center of a decent-sized room filled with various books and toys. In front of me was a blue door with strange bright silver runes etched into its wooden surface. I reached out for the knob and the door slowly opened, but I couldn't see anything. The doyer was blocked by some kind of obsidian mess. What is that? I asked, as I took a step back and made a cursory glance around the room again. Am I inside my head right now? To be honest, I thought I'd be surrounded by squishy, squiggly pink walls of my brain. Yes, and that's the block inside your head, Reese said from right behind me. I squeaked and turned around. Holy crap, where did you come from? Instead of answering, he stepped closer to the mass and lightly placed his palm up against his inky surface. He pulled away from it with a strange look on his face. Oh, interesting. It's very interesting. It's as if two magnetic poles are faced together. What does that mean? I asked. Well, there seems to be some kind of resistance. I can go through it, see? I watched as he tried again, but the mass seemed to be pushing his hands off its surface. It jiggled slightly from where Reese had touched it, rejecting him from prying into whatever was behind it. You give it a try. I stepped up beside him and stared up at the swirling pool of darkness. I tentatively placed my outstretched palm against the surface, and at first I expected it to reject me as well. I watched with wide eyes as my entire hand slid through it with ease. It must have worked like some kind of biometric lock. I turned to Rees, who motioned me to proceed. I looked back at the mass in front of me, and I braced myself right before I stepped through the door. Then, all at once, I was plunged into darkness. I screamed as my mind exploded like a grenade, a whirlwind of fragments howling as they spun around and through me. It felt like a part of my skull was splitting open, releasing something that I didn't understand, something brand new and completely foreign. And suddenly... Scenes of my childhood flashed in front of my eyes. I stood in a cemetery. Rows of tombstones stood erect. Some were crumbling with age and neglect. Others were smooth marble, embedded in the ground with glossy writing etched perfectly on their surface. My grandmother curled her soft fingers in my small ones as we made our way to the family's graves. Others were of Roland and when we were kids and my parents before the tragedy. The memories, if that's what they were, came at me even faster, like fragments of colourful flying glass. And then, suddenly, it all stopped. It was pitch black, and I quickly noticed that my eyes were closed. Music blared in my ears. I opened my eyes slowly, and tried to lift my arms in order to push myself up into a sitting position. But I realised that my body was tangled underneath weighted blankets. I tried to push them off, but I couldn't. Of course I couldn't. I am only a passenger reliving what had already happened in the past. 
I cast my gaze around and I immediately knew that I was back in my childhood bedroom. I could see flickering red and green Christmas lights outside my window. There was a calendar on the wall beside my bed that read December 20th, 2010. This was the night my family was killed. My bedroom door opened and I quickly shut my eyes as the footsteps got closer. I felt the side of my bed dip as someone sat down, nudging me slightly. I opened my eyes again and turned toward the figure blanketed by the darkness. I watched as the figure reached over and turned on the lamp. I looked up into the dark eyes of an almost mirror image of myself. But uh, that's not possible. I was an only child. I didn't have siblings, let alone a freaking twin. I would have remembered that right. Even though present me is freaking out, strapped down on a mental roller coaster, past me is calm as I stared up at him. He kept his eyes on me as he slipped my headphones off. Harlan? I asked. The boy, named Harlan, placed a finger to his lips and whispered, It's time, Gav. I shook my head at him and pushed myself up into a sitting position. What do you mean? When he got closer, I could see dark, spidery lines underneath his black eyes. I glanced down and I gasped and jerked away from his touch when I spotted blood on his pyjamas. I felt a wave of dread as the word sank in like blades to my gut. Don't tell me you... I twisted away from him and quickly got up from the bed, but before I could reach the hallway, I was yanked backward. I felt nails graze the back of my neck as he grabbed me by the collar of my shirt. We both collided to the floor, and I cried out as something bit into my shoulder blade. My brother quickly climbed on top of me, pinning me underneath him. He cupped a hand to my chin, and I panicked as I tried to pull my head away, but he tightened his grip on my face. Are you seriously still trying to be like them, Gav? He sneered. It'd be much easier for both of us if you'd stop pretending to be something you're not. <laughs> Get off me! I hissed through clenched teeth. I struggled, flexing against my brother's grip. You're a monster. Well, he chuckled. <laughs> Correction, I'm a demon, and so are you, bro. I averted my eyes and bit into my bottom lip in order to keep my tears from falling. I don't want to do it, I said meekly. Are you sure? I think I know you better than you know yourself. We're practically the same person, he said. Have you forgotten that they summoned our father so that they could live a better life? In exchange, they promised to repay him. And they broke that promise instead. Sh sh shut up, I snapped. Harlan growled, and in less than the blink of an eye, he hauled me across the room close to the window. Harlan loomed over me again, and he looked as pissed off as I felt. His teeth were bared and his hands were clenched, so tight I was expecting to see blood at any moment. When they come home, I'll make sure their debt is paid in blood. I bared my teeth right back as I managed to grab onto the front of his shirt. Don't you dare touch them! I was about to try and push him away from me again when I heard a car pull up the driveway. Harlan's expression darkened, his lips curled into a nasty grin. No! My grip on his shirt tightened. He smiled down at me, pushing my hand away from him. Yes, oh, what a story this'll make. I struggled under him, kicking and clawing at him, but to no avail. He continued. I have it all planned out. Father brutally murders family and self. That's a gripping headline, don't you think? The folks of this quaint little town don't get the juicy homicide stories like the big cities. This will be the talk of the town for years. I tried to free myself from under him, begging him to leave me alone. But he just stared at me for a moment, contemplating something. Then he got to his feet. I need you to stay put for a bit. Harlan! Before I could finish my sentence, he stomped down, effortlessly crushing my kneecap. I reeled from the excruciating pain. Ah, you really are pathetic, he spat as he walked over to the door. The moment you let go of your delusional desire to be human, the better off you'll be. His footsteps grew faint as he descended the stairs just as I heard our parents opening the front door. 
The dawning horror that was about to happen made me release a cry of throat-tearing fear and pleading desperation. Panic consumed me when I heard their screams of terror. Ignoring the pain in my leg, I started dragging myself across the floor toward my bed. I reached inside myself and opened the door, holding back my power. It was like opening a furnace. Heat flared inside of my chest and roared through my veins like a spark following a fuse. I felt my pain being alleviated as I healed myself. I placed my hands on my bed and slowly got to my feet. I stumbled forward and made my way to the door. I pushed it open and started to make my way down the hall. But I froze as I neared the guest bedroom across from the stairs where my grandparents were temporarily sleeping. I saw crimson footprints that trailed from the room on the grey carpeted floor. The door to the room was slightly open, and a metallic scent hit my nostrils as I warily approached. A snake-like feeling of unease washed over me. My ten-year-old self didn't have to see this, but I had no control over my body. I tentatively reached for the knob, and what I saw made my blood run cold. I collapsed against the wall, my shoulder bumped into the side of the dresser. Lying in a pool of blood were the butchered bodies of my grandparents, slumped up against the wall. Oh, it was absolute carnage. Blood painted the walls in messy strokes, seeping into the carpet. I clutched my chest and raised my other hand to my mouth. I tried not to retch from the sight. I wanted to look away, but I couldn't. I was so fixed on the gory scene in front of me that I hadn't heard my mother's footsteps behind me. My mother, Anna, lifted me up and I clung tightly against her as she curled her hand in mine. Gavin, baby, don't look. Stay close to me, though, okay? She whispered. Her hand was clammy, and I glanced upward and noticed how frightened she looked. She motioned for me to be quiet as we cautiously stepped back into the hallway. I heard the softness of a footfall near the base of the stairs. Oh, Harlan asked from somewhere down below. Are we playing hide and seek? Okay, better hide, because I'm going to start counting now. One... Anna tightened her grip on my hand as we quickly made our way back down the hall, just as he started counting. My mother stopped in front of my father's office and ushered me inside. She went over to the large oak desk and we crawled underneath it. He was just pulling the chair in front of us when we heard him speak. Ready or not, here I come. I could hear him climbing the stairs, going into each room and searching for us. Anna pulled me in close when he entered the room we were in. I can hear your heart beating. It's like a little wounded animal hurling its broken body against the walls of its cage. <sighs> Such a pretty song, Harlan said. I watched as his shadow move toward the closet on our left. But before he could open it, I heard a loud clanging sound coming from somewhere down the hall. Harlan paused and then chuckled as he stepped away from the closet, quickly making his way out of the room. After we were certain that he was gone, she turned to me and whispered, We're going to have to make our way out of the front door, but I'll need you to be quiet. Can you do that, Gavin? I nodded. She gently pushed the chair back and we left our little hiding place. She made a sweep of the hallway before she took my hand again. We heard Harlan searching the master bedroom, and we took that opportunity to quickly descend the stairs and make our way to the living room. Well, the room was a mess. The sofa had been ripped apart and some of the cushions were torn lengthwise, their cotton innards strewn all over the floor. The pictures above the broken television were nicked and scratched, as if blades had been sliced through them. I spotted my father's jacket and duffel bag, but he was nowhere to be seen. Ah, I found you. We both turned around just as Harlan came down the stairs, jumping off the last few steps with a huge grin on his face. Anna grabbed me by the hand again and tried the front door, but it wouldn't open. Harlan shot forward so fast I didn't even see him move. He grabbed her by the hand, twisting her wrist and forcing her to let go of my arm. A feeling of terror rushed through me, as did pure rage. I lunged for him, grabbing him by his hair. 
He screamed in pain and elbowed me in the face. And the force of the hit made my head snap to the side, and I crashed into the Christmas tree. I leaned forward and brought my hand up to my nose. The hit felt like a lightning strike to the face. My vision blurred, and I clenched my jaw. A warm feeling of relief numbed the pain that quickly spread from my head to my nose, right above my cheekbones. I tasted copper in the back of my tongue, and I grimaced. I looked up just as Harlem pulled back his free arm, his fingers flexing as his nails grew into sharp claws. Get the hell away from her. My father, Ethan, stood in the alcove with a gun trained on Harlan. Harlan lowered his arm to glance over his shoulder. You're still alive, he asked incredulously. How is that possible? To answer his question, Ethan pulled out an empty syringe from his pocket and tossed it to the ground where it rolled right beside him. Harlan sneered at him and released Anna, who quickly ran over to me, checking me over. Ah, I see. He cocked his head to the side. Let me guess, that's the only one you had. And by the look on my father's face, Harlan was correct. Without glancing over at us, my father yelled. Guns inside my duffel. Take it and get to the basement. What about you? Anna interjected as she unzipped the duffel. He must have sent those things after us. And now one of them has possessed our boy, he said. Get to the basement before more of them come. Possessed? Ah, oh, please. Harlan closed his eyes and scoffed. He cracked his neck, and when he opened his eyes again, they were inky black. His voice deepened. Pure demon speak now. I was born this way. Go! Ethan yelled as he kept the gun trained on Harlan. Harlan glanced in my direction and smiled. I'll see you in a bit. Before I could say anything, Anna grabbed the gun and pulled me with her. We descended the stairs and I ran over to the large metal shelf toward the back, hidden behind some boxes. Anna made her way over to the cabinet by the washer. I pushed the boxes aside, but before I could enter the panic room, I heard my father scream for us to hide, right before I heard his gun go off. I felt a wave of dread when I turned towards the basement stairs. There was a darkness, the shadows along the walls around it wiggling like snakes. No, I whimpered. The darkness shifts and starts to pull into something solid, into something familiar yet frightening. My brother's demonic form stood tall and menacing. His skin was the colour of polished onyx. Pupils black with specks of white, and they were narrowed in Hannah's direction. She cursed and aimed the gun at Harlan. Six large shadow-like tendrils sprung forth from his back, fanning out like giant peacock feathers. They stretched and curled at the tips as if preparing to strike like scorpion tails. In a flash, one of the tendrils slid around her torso. She screamed in terror as he lifted her up off the ground. With a slight jerk, he flung her against the shelf like she was nothing but a ragdoll. Even though the blow seemed to cripple her, she was still able to move. And with a powerful grunt, Anna rolled onto her stomach and slowly crawled her way across the floor toward the gun. Harlan manifested right beside her. She held him pain as his clawed foot pressed down on the back of her head. Oh, do something, my mind screamed. Anything. I frantically searched for something to use and almost smiled when I spotted pruning shears on the ground. And I grabbed for them. Without thinking, I ran up behind my brother and with all the strength I could muster, I jammed them into his back right beneath one of his tendrils. The angry roar that left his lips was savage. He whipped around, his face contorted into a snarl. He snatched my wrist as he reached for the shears with another tendril. He pulled them out with a sharp hiss and held the shears up in front of him. And then he glanced down at Anna, who was still struggling beneath him. A wicked look crossed his features, and he immediately brought the shears down. She shrieked and thrashed as he stabbed her over and over again. My pleads and cries for him to stop fell on deaf ears. Instead, he released a dark laugh, gleeful. 
He clutched me against himself, denying all of my own struggles to escape. We may be twins, but he was stronger than me, always had been. I watched helplessly as Anna gasped and screamed. I had a loud, sickening crunch, and the room was quiet again. He released me and I collapsed to the floor. I grimaced, my body racked with sobs, when I heard him ripping into flesh. After he was done, he turned around and looked down at me with a sharp smile. A small sound escaped me. It was a weak and wounded sound. My breath hitched as he reached out with one hand, beseeching. Let's go, he said. I shook my head and crawled backwards. Angry tears trailed down my cheeks as I snapped. Get away from me. Your fault. This is all your fault. Just leave me alone. Harlan straightened, his tendrils pulled back in and around him. He was breathing hard. He threw his head back, infuriated, and released an ungodly roar that shook the whole house. You want me to leave you alone? Fine, he growled. You should have embraced your true self. If you had, you might have been able to save them. I raked my hands through my hair, my fingers clutching my head in desperation for some relief to the panic and despair that was twisting inside my chest. Oh, Harlan, I choked out. Wait. I looked up towards the basement stairs. I tried to reach out to him through our bond, but his presence was gone. I glanced over at my mother's lifeless body. Another sob tore its way out of me. The deaths of my family and the fear in knowing that my brother had abandoned me just like that made something deep inside of me break. Harlan, I begged. Please, please come back. I was breathing so hard, gasping, and I couldn't stop crying. I screamed and begged for the one who caused all my pain to come back and make everything all right again. And these conflicting emotions were overwhelming. It mixed with my own guilt, creating some god-awful concoction that made me want to throw up. And something had to give. Suddenly the washer beside me burst open and water spilled all around me, seeping into my clothes. I gripped my arms and curled into myself. I could feel my bones shifting, muscles ripping and reforming, and my nails lengthening. I gritted my teeth as I willed myself to stay human. God, it hurts! It hurts so much! I just wanted it to stop hurting. I felt numb and dizzy. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't think, I couldn't see. I don't... I don't want to know, I begged. Don't make me. Please don't make me. I don't want to remember... him. I threw my head back then and released a scream so loud and broken before I collapsed on the floor. I could have sworn that I heard someone calling out to me right before I separated myself from consciousness. Part 6. Hunting Ground It began with a headache, a deep drumming that pulsated within the crevices of my mind. My eyes felt like they were shaking inside their sockets, louder and louder as inklings of my consciousness returned, and I felt like I was no longer engulfed in the darkness as light seeped in through my eyelids. My eyes snapped open and I bolted upright, drenched in cold sweat. Oh God, I don't feel so good, I mumbled. Race grabbed a small bin from somewhere and quickly placed it at my feet just in time. Yeah, that's pretty evident, Reese said pointedly. I'll be right back. When I couldn't expel any more, I shoved the bucket away from me and bent over my knees, clutching my head in my hands. It was too much, it was all too much. This revelation was absolutely terrifying. Gavin? Roland asked. He leaned forward slightly, reaching out to touch my shoulder, but froze when I jerked away from him. I'm fine, Roland. Just give me a moment, I whispered. My tongue felt thick and heavy as lead in my mouth, and it was difficult to speak clearly. Reese came back with a tall glass of water and a small vial filled with something purple. What's that? I managed to ask. This, Reese explained as he held up the vial. 
is something that will help with a headache and nausea. I shrugged as he handed it to me, and without thinking twice about it, I swallowed every last drop. The liquid went down smoothly, almost like warm honey. Better? Reese asked as he took the now empty vial away from me. I nodded. Whatever that purple substance was, it was working. I swallowed, and the throbbing inside my head eased. I didn't feel like I was dealing with a horrible hangover anymore. God, that really helped, thanks. You're welcome. Now, do you think you're ready to explain what you saw? Reese asked. He's back against the sofa and nodded. Reese placed a glass of water on the table beside me and sat back down in his seat, motioning for me to begin. Well, the memory was of the night my family died, were killed. They were murdered by my... I started, but then paused. Did I really want to tell him the whole truth? I just found out that I'm a demon. I apparently also have a twin brother who, by the way, slaughtered our family. I was told that my family died from a gas leak, and I was incredibly lucky to survive. Well, for a long time I didn't truly believe that. I always felt like it wasn't an accident, that it was something else, something more sinister, and I was right. I'd only buried the painful truth deep within me, so I couldn't remember. From what I know, demons are terrifying beings associated with everything evil in the world. How could I tell them what I really am? I pictured the revulsion on Roland's face once he learned that his best friend was a demon. Well, I wanted to scream, and if I could purge the demonic part out of myself so that I could go back to feeling like a semi-normal human being again, well... My family was murdered by a demon, I finally said. I was the only survivor. A demon? Roland whispered right next to me. I watched as his eyes bled a deep amber color. His fingers dug into the flesh of his palms. I flinched and I quickly averted my eyes, feeling another urge to throw up. Roland's reaction cemented my decision. I continued omitting some parts of the memory. Why was the demon there to begin with? Reese asked. Was the demon trying to possess someone in your family? Perhaps a deal was made and they didn't hold up their end of the deal. I... I don't know, I lied. The demon didn't say. I mean, if my parents made some sort of deal or something, I wouldn't have known about it. Then another thought hit me. It might be a lie, but it would make sense to Reese and Roland, hopefully. Maybe the demon that murdered my family is somehow connected to the ones who attacked us that night. Now that I think about it, it kind of makes sense, Roland agreed. Uh, that could be a possibility. Now you told us that you were the one, the only one, that survived. Do you have any idea why? Reese asked. A voice, I said. I remember hearing a voice. Maybe more, I don't know. I guess that maybe the demon was interrupted before he could finish the job. We all jumped when Roland's ringtone cut through the room. He quickly pulled it out and got to his feet. Oh, sorry, I'll be right back. Hey, uh, where are you going? I asked. It's Elijah. I'll just be right outside the door, he replied, before he stepped out into the hallway. Reese turned back to me with a reassuring smile and asked if I was all right. Yeah, I'm fine, I nodded. I'm just exhausted. Thank you for doing all of this, Reese. Reese gave me a small smile. I'm glad I was able to help. Was there anything else you can recall from memory? He then asked. Anything at all? I shook my head. No, that's all I can remember. I'm sorry. What for? You have nothing to apologize for, Gavin, Reese said. Before I could say anything else, the door opened and Roland quickly walked over to us with a huge smile on his face. Hey, good news, he said. They found them. Well, it's been almost a month since Roland and I went to Seattle with Oliver and Layla to meet with Reese. The BSID had tracked down the group of demons that were after me and dealt with them. And since there were no signs of any demonic activity in connection with that group, I was able to go back home alone. Roland was concerned about it at first, but after a while he finally agreed to it. 
although he didn't have much of a choice given the fact that he had to take a two-week-long trip back up to the cabin for pack business. It was around seven when I entered the small bar and grill. Above the bar were two flat screens. One showed some sporting event and the other the news. A picture of a young woman with long red hair popped up on the screen. She'd been missing for over a month and was last seen with her friends hiking in the forest just outside of town. She was just one of the ten missing person cases in the span of a year. I pulled the glass to my lips, only to realize that it was empty. I slouched slightly in my seat and sighed. I glanced over at the bartender, but she was busy dealing with the evening crowd. I glanced up at the digital clock above the restrooms. I've been sitting in the bar for almost two hours now, contemplating what I should do if anyone found out my secret. What would Roland do if he found out I wasn't being completely honest with him? And worst of all, how would he react to having a demon as a best friend and roommate? And I couldn't keep something like that from my best friend forever. What would happen if the rest of his family found out? Elijah had made it quite clear how he felt about demons. I shook my head. My mind was made up. I've been able to keep my ability to sense the demonic hidden for over 12 years... I think I could hide the fact that I'm some demon spawn. No problem, right? I licked my lips and placed my empty glass on the table. I hugged my arms to my sides as I slowly weaved my way through the sea of moving, inebriated bodies, being mindful not to bump into anyone as I headed for the doors. The rain greeted me, and I frowned as I pulled my hood up. I was just about to pull out my phone to text Roland when I almost walked directly into someone. A young man around my age with white hair dipped in red tips and dark eyes. Oh, sorry, excuse me, I mumbled as I moved out of the way for him to enter the bar. The man stepped away from the door and just stared at me with a smirk on his face. It's been a while, hasn't it, Gavin? I backed away from him. My mouth opened and closed as my brain tried to come up with something to say. How, how did you... Who are you? You really don't recognize me from the hotel bar? He asked as he gave me a wink. When I didn't answer, he continued. All right, let's go a little farther back. The bowling alley? When I still didn't answer, the man chuckled and rolled his eyes as if he'd just remembered something so obvious. Ah, that's right. I'm not wearing her face anymore. A sudden dread pulled in my gut as his demonic face rippled beneath his human facade. Arian, I breathed. Yes, well, not anymore, he said. We need to talk. And I was running down the street before he could finish his sentence. The demon was somehow back, and it had found me. The sound of approaching footsteps were right behind me, clacking on the wet pavement. There were several blocks between the little bar and my house, but I couldn't risk going back home. If it was a fight the demon wanted, then we'll have it somewhere away from the town. I couldn't live with myself if anyone else became collateral because of me. I cursed and dropped through a narrow cut-through between two buildings, tossing a few trash cans behind me as I made my way into the large forest at the edge of town. I barely touched the ground as I followed a thin vein of a hiking trail, Eventually I broke off the trail and through the woods. I brushed past a thin skeleton of branches. They clawed at my face, but I didn't care. My own survival instinct and panic ripped through every nerve in my body, and it was pushing me to go faster. I saw red traffic lights several feet in front of me, but before I could reach the road, my foot caught in something, and the ground collapsed right beneath me. I screamed and tried to grab hold of something, I managed to grab onto a tree root protruding from the soil, but it snapped and I fell right into something large enough to hold a fully grown human. Soft light from the full moon above was enough for me to realize that I was stuck inside a burlap sack. I twisted around and tried to free myself. I opened my mouth in order to scream for help when I remembered that the shape-shifting demon was somewhere close by, looking for me. I dragged in a deep breath and collected myself. I raked my sharp fingernails through my hair in frustration. Wait a minute. I jerked my hands away and raised them up to my face. I had claws. Obsidian claws. 
I reached out and brought my right hand down against the rough fabric, easily ripping through it. I carefully climbed my way out of the material and looked around. It was dark and cold, and I realized that I was pulled down into some kind of underground tunnel. I felt my claws revert back into blunt human nails, and I sighed. I hoped that whatever made the trap wasn't still around. Ah, oh, great, I thought. I must now face the long dark of Moria. I pulled my phone from my pocket and clicked on the flashlight as I began to make my way forward. I didn't know how long I'd been walking. I cursed as I came to a stop. The tunnel split into two opposite directions. The side of the tunnel forking off made me realize getting lost down here in the darkness was becoming an increasingly likely outcome. I turned to go right when a sudden noise sliced through the darkness. It was a low, pain-filled sound that came from down the tunnel in front of me. A chill shot through my body and I froze. It sounded like a woman moaning and it didn't stop. It just got louder until it was followed by a horrible, piercing scream, a long wail of absolute agony. And then the tunnel went silent. I turned around and took off left. Oh shit, oh shit, I whimpered. My heart fluttered with icy dread, my stomach knotted in on itself. My nerves were on a knife's edge, ears pricked and skin covered in goosebumps. My hand hovered lightly over my blade as I went further into the darkness. The tunnel became narrow, so narrow that possibly only two people could squeeze through with some effort. An overwhelming surge of claustrophobia struck me. Questions besieged my brain, and I made a wrong turn. Was there a way out? It might have been an hour or more, but after a long while I was greeted by a room with a little light to my far left. I didn't hear anything coming from the room itself, so I warily made my way forward. The room was about the size of a two-door garage. It smelt as if it had recently housed a dying animal. A small bulb hung from the ceiling, which gave me enough light to see. There were blood smears on the floor and discarded clothing piled up inside large baskets. In the center of the room was a small tray with twisted surgical instruments beside a long steel table you could see in a morgue. There was another room on the right, hidden behind a plastic vinyl strip curtain. What in the actual fuck? I was about to head out into the tunnel again, to get as far away from this place as possible, when I heard footsteps. With nowhere else to go, I quickly pushed my way through the curtain. Something bumped against my back. My phone slipped out of my fingers and skidded across the floor. I slowly turned around to look for it, when I gasped in horror. Bodies. Ten preserved, naked human bodies were suspended by large meat hooks a few feet off the floor. Their abdomens were cut open, their organs removed. One of them looked familiar, and my gut twisted when I realized who it was. It was a woman. The missing woman from the news. I stumbled away from them and pressed myself against the wall behind some crates and baskets filled with God knows what. The footsteps were close now. They were heavy, slow, shuffling steps. I peeked around the corner and my eyes widened as the source of the sound entered the room. It was a tall, burly man wearing a blood-stained white work shirt under a strap harness that held a sword made out of the blade of a chainsaw. His face was hidden behind a grey porcelain mask. His shoulders were wide, wide enough to be carrying something large inside of a burlap sack. He closed the door behind him and dropped the sack onto the metal slab with a loud, wet thunk. Something long and slimy spilled out of the opening and over the side of the table. Hair. It was a tangled mess of human hair. This man was the reason for all those people going missing. This man, this monster, trapped them and killed them in a room beneath the woods, and I just happened to stumble upon his hunting ground. I turned away and crouched low. I stayed as silent as I could. My hands trembled as I held them over my mouth, doing my best to hide my shaky breath as he started to reach into the sack. While he was busy, I began to stealthily make my way toward the door. I was only a foot away from it when he spoke. 
You foolish human. You really think I didn't smell you from all the way down in the tunnel? I turned to face him just as his clawed hand reached upward, removing the mask from his face. It was something out of a nightmare. Beady black eyes surrounded by exposed muscles stretching halfway to his scalp. He snarled as his maw split into four pieces, each filled with sharp, needle-like teeth. I stumbled backward as he stalked toward me, brandishing his chainsaw sword. For a moment I thought I was going to die when I suddenly felt it. The familiar surge of power. The firebrand burn coursed its way through my veins and wrapped around my spine. Stay away from me, I yelled, and my words ripped their way out of me, the panic that bubbled in the center of my chest finding an escape valve. My eyes widened as the monster was suddenly launched backward, crashing into the table. Before he could get to his feet, he was lifted into the air and tossed across the room. I reached outward towards the incision tools on the tray. Each of them slowly floated into the air, and with a slight jerk of my wrist, they twisted around, the blades trained on the monster. The monster screamed in pain as each tool pierced into his flesh. While he was preoccupied with pulling them out of his exposed flesh, I quickly turned around and tried for the door. But it wouldn't open. I slammed my fist against it in terror. Oh, you have got to be shitting me. I whirled around just as he got to his feet, blood oozing from his face. I smiled when I noticed one of them had struck deep into his right eye socket. I tried to pull forth my power again, but to my horror, nothing happened. With a cry of outrage, the monster charged at me, his chainsaw sword held high, but I was already in motion. I rolled the second I hit the ground. His sword swung right where I stood just seconds ago, embedding itself into the door. I reached behind me, pulled the blade from my belt, and stabbed it into the monster's thigh with all the force I had. The monster howled. Dark blood drenched his trousers and spilled to the ground. I tried to wrench the blade back, desperate to get another blow in, but I struck deep into his leg, deep into the bone. But before I had a chance to move, an iron hand curled in the collar of my coat, lifting me several feet off the floor like it was nothing, slamming me against the wall right next to the room full of hanging corpses. I groaned as a long black tongue slithered out of his maw, and licked a slimy trail against the forehead to the bottom of my chin. He paused and for a second I could have sworn I saw the look of surprise in his eyes. Your eyes? You're not human. What are you? I felt the claws lengthen as I dug my fingers into the monster's beefy arm. The monster growled from the pain, but he didn't loosen his grip on me. With his free hand, he reached for his sword. Before he could wrench it free, a large grey clawed arm pierced right through his stomach from behind. The monster roared in pain and released me. I scrambled away as he tried to move, but whatever held him in place was incredibly strong. You know, I used to wonder that myself, said a human voice. The monster gave one last cry of pain before the arm released him. He collapsed to the ground with a sickening thud. It was a shape-shifting demon. He was still human aside from the large demonic appendage that was his right arm. A bolt of anger shut up my spine and I wrenched my dagger loose from the monster's leg, holding it up in front of me. Stay away from me, asshole. He held up his blood-stained arm and flexed his fingers, and I watched as it reverted back to normal. Well, my name's Cal, actually, and I just saved your ass, Gavin. No need for such hostility. That's bullshit. I know exactly why you're here. You want to go for round two? Oh, come on. You failed to kill me the first time, Gavin, the demon Cal said as he brought his hand to his neck right below a light scar. What makes you think you'll be able to do it this time around? Well, this time, I'll make sure I kill you. Well, I highly doubt you'd even be able to land a good hit on me a second time. He smirked. Look, I'm not here to fight. I'm here to talk. If it'll make you feel better, we can chat in a public place. I hear that the Love Triangle has the best calzones in town. What do you say? I kept my blade trained on him as I made my way over to the curtains. I really have nothing to say to you. Hey, where are you going? 
I ignored him and pushed my way past the curtains. I did my best to avoid glancing up as I bent down and grabbed my phone from the floor, relieved that it wasn't broken. Ah, oh, what an interesting little setup, he commented from behind me, but his voice sounded uninterested. I glared over my shoulder at him. Oh, of course you'd say something like that. I wouldn't expect anything different since you're basically the same. Do not compare me to that bottom feeder, he growled. Then he smiled a toothy smile. Besides, I could do so much worse. I turned away from him and bit my tongue as I started to unlock my phone. I really didn't want to waste any more time with this murderous lunatic. What are you doing? Texting someone who works for the BSID, I answered, thinking that the mention of the BSID would make him leave in order to avoid being caught. It didn't. What for? He asked incredulously. What the hell do you think? I spat as I sent a message to Layla. I really don't know why I'm giving you an explanation. It's not like you give a shit. I mean, you're a demon. And what do you think you are? Just because you choose to ignore your demon blood doesn't change the fact that you're a demon too. I'm not like you, I argued. Cal scoffed. Oh, you're definitely one of us, Gavin. Stop denying it. I mean, I'm not a killer, I growled. But he only rolled his eyes at that. How did you know? That you're a demon too? I found out that night. Got a good look at your eyes before your wolfy friend decided to ruin our alone time together. Cal paused for a moment before he spoke. They're still looking for you. What are you talking about? I asked. Your demon pals? The BSID took care of them. That's what they want you to think. I assure you, from a demon who used to work for them, they won't stop until they get you. No amount of hiding will help you, and eventually you'll slip up. The only way to stop them is if we help each other. Well, I laughed. <laughs> you serious? Why would I even consider teaming up with you? You'd probably kill me if given the chance. If you hadn't noticed, I'm not some kind of fighter. Hell, I barely have any control over my powers. If I really wanted to kill you, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. I used to work for them, but I failed to bring you in. Before they could kill me, I ran. Look, I can help you. I'm the only one who can help you. You may not be a fighter now, but you can be. You're a demon, Gavin. You have what it takes to help me bring them down. What's in it for you? I asked. He smiled at that. Revenge. <sighs> I need time to think, I said, going pale at the very thought of what I was agreeing to. When part of me, the logical side of me, was berating myself about how stupid this plan was. It was catastrophically stupid, like Sam Winchester trusting Ruby stupid. Still, I considered Cal's plan for a few moments. My initial thought was to refuse, to leave and tell Elijah. He'd know what to do, right? Maybe I could even tell the BSID about Cal and have them deal with him. But, well, I really was tired of looking over my shoulder, and Cal was right. If these demons were still around, getting rid of Cal wasn't going to fix the problem. They'd still come after me, and I could slip up. I'm glancing over at Cal, who was inspecting the chainsaw sword. Oh yeah, I'm definitely keeping this, he said with finality. Well, I have slipped up. So, if this was a chance, even a small one, I should take it. All right, I said. I'm in. So there you go, my dear friends. It's been a while since uh, we did part five, but um, well worth the wait as far as I'm concerned. So lots more of this to come, I think. What do you think? Thoughts, feelings, anything else you want to say? In the comment section below the video. And as ever, I will do my best to joining the conversation. <laughs> That's Friday already. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of these series that I've been um, neglecting for a while, so who knows, you might be getting something tomorrow night as well. Um, might be a bit of a delay with the Operation Apple Tree. Um, with uh, Luke Hemingway, I'm in lots of discussion about where it's going, how long we need to uh, wait and stuff like that. But it's definitely coming soon, maybe not this Sunday though, so don't be too disappointed. Something else will be coming along anyway. 
Oh, enough for me for one evening. Till the next time, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.